I am live. Do good lord. Hello, everyone. Let's see what's going on. Um, sorry I'm running a bit late. But the joyous thing that is XSplit decided that it didn't believe I was me anymore. So uh, refused to log me in until I did about four different verif verifications. I am not sure why today it decided to pick today to do it. I have no idea. Right, let's see. Hello, Carl McGasberg. Hello, John Shea. Hello, Austin Harmon. Yes, you are, Ali. And hello, Ian Carr. Evening all. A bit late in the sense because this raid was originally planned to take place on the night of the anniversary of the Battle of Trafalgar. Yes, but they had a small problem with HMS Eagle. Um... Hello, Buccaneer. Hello, Dan Freeman. <laughs> Hello, Albert Zasky. Hello, Silly Manakata. Hello, Vice Admiral Nelson, DGV40, Jack Hunter, Jay Ingmuff, Gordon Collins, Paul Beswick. Is he suffering from a lack of iron brew? Suffering from, as I said, a annoying exploit deciding to broadcasting software, deciding to be fun. Um... Now, there's a reason we're doing it today and rather than tomorrow on all these things because we have got a whole series of Bilge Pump special videos coming out and I really sort of didn't want to jump in too much on that. Also, I thought this might be a sort of a nice way to talk about that and sort of uh, promote it a bit before it comes out. So that's why I'm doing it this. Although that's going to be a series spread over a few weeks, uh, over some weeks because... Frankly, poor Jamie, our video editor, the member who does the video editing, is overworked, underpaid, and, well, the only thing he isn't is underloved, because we do love him. He's amazing. Hello, D D hello, G G Derp Squad. Hello, William Bolton. He's never early. He's always late. The first thing you learn is you always have to wait. I, I try to be on time every time. It's just... Honestly, I just have so many lectures that are in the day, and it's just, it takes, tonight, today it was X split. I do try to be on time, though. I always press the button, if in doubt I press the button at 6 o'clock. Whether it lets me through at 6 o'clock, or makes me wait, take 10 minutes, I never know. Felix Bean. Hello, just back from Mr. Felton's Japanese attack on Australia. Ooh. Dunner uh, Kamen. No, no, he's never late, nor is he early. He arrives precisely when he means to. Yeah, I I, I do like to be, prefer to be on time, trust me. I'm going to be turning that light down in a second, because currently it's making me blink a lot. Um, did it, did it? <laughs> hello, Greg Satowski. How you, hello, Jermic. Let's see. Hello, Blue Shirt Butter. Hello. Do, 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 do. Let's see. <laughs> oh. There was actually possibly at some point come on the split work. Damn, you might have been going on. Excuse the French there. Um. Hello, Jalingoff. Hello, Carl Hardman. Hello, Potter. Hello, Martin Doc. And, well, Earthborn Gnome. I don't think I've seen you before, so hello. It's a fun times. Right. I think we're out there. That afternoon, I thought it was Atreus that had the hanging fire on the 18th of October. Then in interim, Eagle was damaged. They had all sorts of fun. You had... Illustrious having a hangar fire on the 18th of October. Eagle having engine issues. Those engine issues then leading to fuel leak, uh, fuel management system issues, which meant the Eagle couldn't go. And so by the time everyone was repaired, they went. And they do all sorts of things to get them there.
Dan Freeman, another question to get in. Would the raid have been more successful if the swordfish had been substituted for Blackburn Blackburns? <laughs> oh, God, hell. Uh, no, because the Blackburn Blackburn couldn't carry torpedoes. And if launched from further into the Adriatic, well, then you'd have to deal with far more chance of the um, Italians intercepting you. Although Task Force X does get into the Adriatic, so we will be talking about that because, you know, the Adriatic is actually quite a part of this operation. Come, Dark Squad. I officially finished work at four. I'm ne actually never done by four thirty, even when it when it is a volunteer. Yeah, it's kind of like that being a university lecturer, because technically my lectures finish at five on a Tuesday most of the time. Sometimes they go on later, and on a Thursday sometimes. I don't think I ever actually finish before 5.45, and then I get ready and everything in between. So I've had to, have to get the presentation already. And everything done. And, you know... It's fun. It's fun. Making sure I have a working presentation. It's always a good thing. Now, this is a little different from normal because I have two sets of notes. I have... The Jamie set of notes, which were provided because we were doing the special for Taranto. And I have my PhD thesis open in front of me. Which is, so if at any point I don't appear to be reading the chat, but I am reading something, I'm probably reading my PhD thesis. Before anyone knows what I'm doing, I'm playing around the light because it's starting to disturb me. That's better. Oh. That's better. Oh, I can now see you all without blinking, Eldzheim. Oh. Rapid raise back. To a historian's time is not a factor because it's all in the past. No, but as me and my girlfriend sometimes do explain to people when they're trying to tell us that things need to be done urgently, to a historian, anything less than a hundred years is just not time that's worth counting. Um. Anger. Hello, Anger. Uh, uh, worst are paleontologists and evolutionary biologists. If it's not in millions of years, it's not relevant. Bingo. <laughs> Death Squad. But natural repulsive forces of that one would have fooled the entire fleet under uh, uh, forced the entire Italian fleet underwater. I doubt that. Anyone else getting buffering? You shouldn't be getting buffering. I've turned down the thing to actually prevent, try and prevent buffering. Hmm. And we've got the hardware connection plugged in. Can we access through the KCL uh, the pieces through the KCL library? Not yet. It was placed. Uh, it, it, it's going to be there soon, but it's got to be. It was placed on hold for a while because it upset a <clears throat> couple of professors' theses. We'll leave that to one side, and um, then just didn't have the money to turn into enough copies because you have to get it bound and printed by certain people and to certain standards and you have to get it published and unfortunately by the time it, I was able to and I had the money theoretically saved up uh, my mum got very very ill and so instead of working and being able to use that money to pay for that I had to use that money to help support things and take some time off work to help my mum out and make sure she was okay so that's fine. Hmm, I wonder why we're getting buffering. Anything you can do. Hmm. Huh. Ah, 
I have no idea why it's buffering. Let me have a, a look in the system and find out why. Let me go check. There is a potential. Before I start the PowerPoint, I will go, uh, go check quickly. Be back in a second. I have a feeling I know what the solution is. Have a feeling I know what is actually going on. Well, I hope you can see me in this. I have an answer to the problem. The reason you're all probably experiencing buffering um, is that, to an extent, our computer system is currently overloaded because tonight my sister's lecture is running slightly late. And she has got about 400 students on MS Teams at the moment. And MS Teams really takes up and hogs the internet line. But she's only live for another five minutes. So what I'm going to do is I'm not going to start the presentation for another few minutes. I'll just take questions, okay? So we'll do some questions, and then I'll start the presentation. So hopefully you all got that. Hmm. <laughs> ah. Go on, Collins, add the docs then. Someone else could be using the bandwidth. As I've just said, uh, my sister is using the bandwidth, but it does seem to be running also a fair bit behind. Not sure quite why there's so, there's so much lag going on. Hmm. Oh, yes. What's the early aircraft that could pull off Taranto or Pearl? Um, 
Look, the earliest torpedo bomber, as we'll be discussing in this, is the Sopwith Cuckoo. And we'll be going over her and why she's called the Sopwith Cuckoo. Because she's uh, you're prepared to lay an egg in someone else's nest, is the reason. Uh, during this. But the earliest... So, theoretically, you could have done it with Sopwith Cuckoos. But honestly... That would have probably had the same results as Pearl Harbor. If you want to pull off Tranto, pretty much the Fairy Swordfish is the only aircraft that could pull it off in the numbers it was and get the level of success it does. <laughs> oh. Gordon Collins, set QOS on your router to give you priority. My sister would kill me. I love you all. I want to give you the best time I can and the best production I can, but I also want to be alive. So, no, I'm not touching the QoS settings. At all. I like this. All right. What is your sister's lecture on? She's just currently teaching the foundation year. Um, I think she's teaching them the maths of bridges and how you design bridge structures and build those. It's a pretty cool one. She does it fairly regularly, but she uh, she really does know what she's talking about, and it's um it's quite well done. Let's see, I'm trying to do everything I can to make sure it's got the minimal usage going on on the uh, online and sorting the things out so you guys can get the best one you can. Let's see. Um, right. Corba, uh, Crowbear 79, can we join the other lecture? Uh, unfortunately, doubtful. Uh, Carl Hammond, how significant was the Royal Dockyard in Pembroke Dock in the Age of Steam and Steel pre-1900? Pretty significant. It was fairly useful. It's a nice big space, especially, for sorting things out and working things. Carl Harmon, any chance the person who designed it was seen as being a bit of cuckoo? Uh, it was Sopwith. It was actually the same person designed the Sopwith cuckoo as designed the Sopwith camels. So, you know, I think he just likes seas. <laughs> Rapid Razorback. Historians don't form good pitchfork wield uh, wielding vengeance posses. No, we tend to find other ways to eviscerate you. For example, you might control them now, but we'll control how people will think about you in a hundred years' time. Always be aware of the judgment of historians, and also, always be aware of people saying, well, what will historians think about this in a hundred years' time? <laughs> historians tend to know, because we all have tend to have written and taught the historians, who have written and taught the historians, who have written and taught the historians, who will be writing about you in a hundred years' time. Yeah, just think about that. Uh, 
Ian Carl, the raid was planned for Matrix Glorious in the mid 1930s during a time of tension. Were swordfish also planned to be used in this operation? In the mid 1930s, swordfish were beginning to sort of be looked in center service. So yes, they were. Well, actually, I think also sharks were available as well. So blackburn sharks. I mean, they were looking at various options for to use. You must remember that actually Glorious actually had a slightly bigger air group than Illustrious did in terms of practical numbers. <laughs> Vice President Musi Green could have caught a scene trouble coming for his second Rome. Uh, Taranto was the city that brought Pyrrhus into Italy. Back in 281 PC. Yeah. Uh, Dan Froon. I think the concept of raid was planned long before 1930s. Oh, yes, it was, but we'll be getting into that. Seth Thompson. Just popping in while on break. Hope your day is going well. It's going okay. Jeff, as the late Ronnie Corbett said, I know my place. And Docs, yep, I know where I like to be alive. But she should be ending shortly. In fact, she should have ended, but I gave her about five more minutes before I sort of started off because I never trust her to end on time. Not that she's not a good sister, just... Mm. It's fun. Oh, would help if I could spell. Always would help if I could spell. Da da da. Jeff Beeler, how and where did the RN practice Toronto style tactics? Malta. Malta. I had a lot of attacks run on it over the years. As did um, Scarpa Flow. Aviator Enterprise, whilst we're waiting, what does everyone think of an idea for a lecture on closing the gap, the Atlantic and airships and aircraft deck? Oh, could be cool. Gorn Cons, also, if a uni want you to work from home, they should supply all the equipment, including good internet connection. At 9.25k uh, per student, I think they can afford it. <laughs> um, at the moment, I'm slowly returning the house because we had Wi Fi, of course, and everything. So I'm slowly building in hardware and all sorts of things to deal with it. And it's fun. It is really is fun to get everything to work. I have no idea. All right, then. Hopefully that works. And 
Sorry about the bit of little distance. I restarted everything, and hopefully that makes it all better. Okay. Ian Carl, did the Japanese consider doing the Pearl Harbor raid at night? They'd have loved to, but they didn't have the aviation facilities the ability to do that. Uh, Carl Harmon, Dr. Clark, wondering how did the army come into possession of Castle Martin Range and importance of Royal Navy Station Manorbeer? I believe it was Navy? Uh, pretty much money. Money is always things. Descott, I feel sorry for the people who have to pull out of a torpedo attack in Valletta Harbor. Choice of castle, harbour wall, or build uh, uh, builds to try and to climb out over. Yep. Good evening, shoot me. <laughs> I know your name should make me laugh, but it does. Uh, right. Jeff Hill, how quickly did the fall of France affect Coastal Command when they realized Ansons were not going to be cutted and fast track bo uh, bow fighters, bow fighters, uh, bow fighters, bow fighters, and Sunderlands? <laughs> fast track? No. Hopefully, it's worked. Hello, Stefan Badring. All good. Thank you. Just been told, definitely off. We're back. Yes, I'm back. Basically, I had to... It, it, it didn't only help that my sister had got off MS Teams. I had to then reset it as well because it had decided it was being stuck with MS Teams. So, you know, it's fun. <laughs> Right then. So let's start off with this. A little bit from my PhD thesis. I'll disappear for a second behind it. Total flying time was just six and a half hours, carrier to carrier. 20 aircraft had inflicted more damage upon the Italian fleet than was inflicted upon the German high seas fleet in the daylight action at the Battle of Jutland. Think about that. More damage inflicted by roughly 20 aircraft in six and a half hours than was inflicted by the Grand Fleet on the high seas fleet at the Battle of Jutland. In truth, it had put like that, it does sound almost easy. And in truth, it had to be a night with a full moon so that navigators could read their charts. And so it was with the wave shimmering black turquoise in reflection of its radiance that 21 purring shadows passed over. Shadows which were collections of canvas, string, and little metal each housing within them two crew shivering through anticipation, fear, cold, a mixture of all three, most likely, and each carrying a heavy load. Very, and None of them were carrying a full three-person crew. It was just considered too dangerous and too much weight. After flying nearly two hours, they reached their target, the safe haven of the enemy fleet. They plunged through the darkness, a feat of skill which had never be forgotten, and by that skill alone had found their enemy. Soon thereafter, the moon was definitely not the only light in the sky. As it was joined by shells bursting into a thousand shooting stars, and as always the case for someone on both sides, they did not follow night. Although, the numbers of casualties on both sides is remarkably low. This is the coming of age of the carriers. This is the coming age of the fleet air arm, and this is what the Royal Navy achieved with Taranto. Anger. The burning clean point was more aimed at solid residue, not CO2 emissions. Hmm. Jeff Hiller. Canada is taking more measures to increase rural internet speeds because of COVID-affected education. Woohoo! 
in car, canvas and Irish linen in place of arm plate. It works. Soaked in gasoline was mainly the observer. <laughs> oh, the observer, the guy, the navigator, the guy who's the navigator, who's principal. You know, there is the classic example that if I go to this. This copy, it's John Wellams with Naval Wings, which I talked about the other day. And... You know... There is this classic point in here. Um... He sits there, and I'm just looking at the section. Uh, he, it's usually car voice. The course for illustrious, incidentally, should be 135 degrees. You might like to set it now. It's being very thoughtful. If you were knocked out while I was still in one piece, I might be able to find my own way home. I, if the observer, who's the person sitting in the back, who's done all the navigation through the dark, gets shot even, or wounded, or just knocked out by the dive, or any of the actions they do, he's given his pilot the route home. And that's the sort of thing they have to do before they're going into attack. This is what this attack is like. This is a human-based computer system attack. So you've got the observer is the navigation computer, the rear gunner, and the target identifier in many ways by looking out and telling them what they're seeing. And spatial awareness. The pilot is the flight computer, the tack computer. All we think, if you think about what a modern pilot flying an aircraft does versus what is done in an aircraft in the 1930s and World War II. You suddenly start to understand why they have two crew. It's very easy these days to sit there and go with hindsight and knowledge of all the systems we have. Oh, yes, you, you can save so much weight by only having one person. You can. You can save lots of weight by only having one person. But that's because you have lots of other things you can put in to replace that other person with. As long as they work. You don't have that option in the 1930s. You don't have those capabilities. Count Gasberg, ever looked at the poster from Iron Maiden, Tailgunner? Gasoline would explain a lot of Eddie's appearance. Uh, I can't remember that one, but it could be good. Hello, HMS Ford. Hello, Brock Bain. In car. Two times nice swordfish at Fleet Aero Museums. Yeah. Dan Freeman, the navigator is the defensive countermeasures. That too. One of the pilots' main important instrument is still having his own mom. <laughs> yeah. That in the 1930s, when a computer was a person, not a machine. Yes. That's good. You can save lots of weight only having one person. However, you'll be lucky to see the plane again once it has gone beyond the horizon. Pretty much. So this is my point whenever people go, Oh, the Royal Navy, they had two-seater fighters. Oh, that was terrible. That was silly. And something going, uh, they wanted a fight. When they were talking about it, they a had a single seater fighter in the works for point defense. That was a very that was a naval version of the Spit, uh, built, a naval aircraft built by Supermarine, which was basically a gull wing Spitfire and would have been amazing. But the Fulmar is a long range fighter, reconnaissance aircraft, and escort fighter for the bombers. <coughs> If you consider what happens to naval attack aircraft when they do anything without a fighter escort, you can understand why a service which is looking at long-range attacks and thinking, we want to make long-range attacks and actually really get to grips with our enemy, is going, you know what, they're going to need a fighter escort. 
And if it's going to be long range, it probably needs a second seat. Now, again, I'm going to play with the ca with the camera a bit. That's better. That is better. So, mm -hmm. just shrink this just a tad. All right. Steph Penang, how good was the Pugli's talk bulge, really? Uh, why did it not work span? Uh, <laughs> right. So, A, partially it didn't work as planned because of where it was hit, where they were hit. And partially it didn't work as planned because... This is going to sound strange. There, it's where they're hit, the context of their hit, i.e. the ships aren't moving. So there's no rushing water going past. And secondly, it just wasn't that good. It was a nice in paper, the Pugles, Torpedo Bulge, but it just wasn't that good in reality. If I just grab a picture of it from somewhere. So, if I add a picture and I can explain it. Desktop, desktop, not on my desktop. No, that's that one. Oh, can I? This is open. No, it's not opening. Okay, back you go. Uh, let's see if I can come up with another way of getting it. Print screen. So, the Pugli's torpedo defense system is um, has problems. Let's just go with it has problems. The whole idea is at its thickest point, it is very good. And of course, it's all based on it being a spherical system, it being, you know, capable of providing multiple layers and the perfect shape. But it also meant if you are a torpedo and you hit it at the right point, you can blast straight through it. And that is what largely happened, because again, these were fairly good crews who were firing these torpedoes. Sorry, none of the pictures I tried will actually show it. Hmm. Dev Squad, who would ever think of a two seat naval fighter? Looks at F4, F14, uh, F18, F, E18G. Yeah. Don't find out. I'm sorry, but every radar carrying board a plane from World War, during World War II needed a second person to cover. It makes operations incredibly more smoothly. All night fighters had two. One, one. Yes, but. How often do you hear people telling you that, oh, they were terrible because they're two-seater aircraft? And you sit there and go, you're wrong. It's like, there's a new book arrived for me to review from Pen and Sword. And it's a new book. And I was really looking forward to it. I was really looking forward to it because it was promising to be a whole new look at something. And honestly, I started off by reading the front of the indoor, uh, the you know, foreword, and I went, oh, uh, because it's just a repeat of the same mantras, and they're wrong. They're just wrong.
Then him, I reckon Lufo can hardly claim things are better on their side. Looks at BF10 and bottom pulls are fine. Come on. Hang on, two seater fighter is better than a bomber. When in the middle of the sea, you're not going to see those short range one seat fighters. No. So having the two seat fighter escorting your bombers makes life a lot easier. Gives your bombers more of a chance. In car, was a two crewed sawfish around our gun and gun, uh, or was the navigator expected to double up? You guessed it, the navigator had to double up. I was asking, were formals able to keep up with swordfish equipped with a torpedo? Must have been quite a slow flight. Uh, <laughs> let's put it this way. The, so even the full Mars used to have to go, do sort of, the swordfish would be flying in a straight line. The sort of the full Mars would be going, uh, and would still be finding itself ahead. Sometimes, what they do is they launch the swordfish first, wait a bit, and then the full Mars would catch them up. Full Mars weren't used in the Taranto raid, though, because it was a night strike and they didn't anticipate coming into, uh, coming into any it an Italian air defence opposition. So they retained the Full Mars back on the air carrier for the air defence role, primarily during the day in the air defence of the task group. However, if you'd had Eagle along, I wouldn't be surprised if A, you'd had more swordfish along, but you'd have A, also B, you'd have had some Full Mars go along in the strike pattern to do probably the flare-dropping role and the bombing role. Because they could sort of do that. They uh, Let's put it this way, they'd worked out how they could fit the things onto them. Evening, Caledron. And hopefully the buffering is now better. Because I'm not getting any alerts anymore. Although it's telling me the audio stream bitrate is 128 kilo is less than it needs it should be. And I have no idea why that is because I have everything set up so it should be good. So I have no idea what's going on there. Hmm. Did the bombs have any effect? 16 flares were dropped east of the harbour. Then the flare dropped another aircraft and made a dive bombing attack to set fire to oil tanks. They burnt all the oil. They damaged the destroyer. They damaged the cruiser. The bombers had an effect. They weren't dropping big bombs. They were 250 pound armour piercing bombs. That's not really the best thing you want for the engaging a destroyer. Uh, you want probably semi armour piercing bombs for a destroyer, but, you know. It does some damage. Earthman 9. I know it's slightly off topic, but it's interesting that the British long range escort fighters were two seaters, but the Americans, I don't believe, ever had a two seater carrier based of fighter. Yes, but there's a difference in the idea of range the British were thinking about operating at. And by the time you do get to the single seat aircraft, you have far more navigation aids. And you have a different style of operation coming on. Hello, Brecken Kending. And Krebber uh, 79. Buffering is gone. Well, hey. Uh, Roland Cash. Did naval divers investigate the harbour pre strike? <laughs> Not officially. Unofficially, in the 1920s and 1930s, there might have been all sorts of interesting visits. Carl Harman. Was Tor Malta still under constant attack when Toronto happened? Yes. In car, I've read that the second mission was planned for the night after Taranto raid, but it was cancelled because of bad weather. Is this correct? And what was planned? It was going to be a repeat, and bad weather might have been stretching it, but Lumley Lister decided the weather was bad. Uh, to quote some of the pilots at the time, even the Light Brigade was only asked to go once. Although, they would have gone. 
So let's start off with these aircraft. Let's look at them. Where did it come from and where did it end? The aircraft. Well, the first generation, as I've already mentioned, was the single seat sop with cuckoo, which was going to lay an egg in your basket. Basically, the Cuckoo is this aircraft the Royal Navy is developing because of frustration. The entire idea of Taranto, the entire idea of the strike of a fleet in this harbour, it all starts off in World War I. Okay, there are two strands of World War I history which feature into Taranto. There is the absolute, unadulterated, sheer frustration the Royal Navy feels with the Germans not coming out to fight. For the Royal Navy, this is vandalism. How are they supposed to do what they do if you hide in harbour? And the trouble is, it's at that, World War One is at that point of time where the defences have developed parity, i.e. they've got strong enough fortifications, they've got strong enough minefields, that you can't go in and do a Copenhagen to them. You can't. You will lose too much. No matter how much you want to. So. By World War II, however, lots of things have developed which allow them to do this i.e. the aircraft. Why? What is the aircraft? Well, when you're talking about it, when you think, start thinking about it, you have to think about what the Navy in World War One is thinking about when it's developing them. It's thinking of the Sop with Cuckoo as an aerial destroyer. Yes, or an aerial torpedo boat destroyer. Uh, torpedo boat. It is literally going to go in... Drop a torpedo. If it hits something, great. If it doesn't hit anything, that's annoying. But what it more matters, and this is the critical thing, what matters most of all is that it will stop the enemy feeling safe in harbour, and the idea is that will drive them out the sea. Anything the British can do to stop the Germans feeling safe in harbour will drive them out to sea. That's their idea. So, history comes along. We've been over the Blackburn, and we're going to be go over the Fairy later this month in terms of the development of these bombers, or the torpedo bombers, and how they develop and how they grow. And they do develop, and they do grow. Sop with Cuckoo wasn't going to be a long-ranged aircraft. It could afford to be a single-seater. Basically, the idea was, and we'll be getting into it, the ship that would launch them would launch them from not very far away. And they would go into the harbour and they would cause merry mayhem. It didn't need to happen. It didn't happen. War ended in time. But the Royal Navy now had a plan. And you know what the Royal Navy's like with a plan. They start developing it. And you also have to remember, in 1918, the British Navy, the Royal Navy, the US Navy, and the Japanese Navy are all allies. And the Japanese Navy and the US Navy have been briefed on the British plan. So before people start thinking, you know what, this is an idea which comes across from something. No, they, they're all thinking about it from about the same point. So before anyone get, starts getting into Pearl Harbor is a complete shock, it's not. It's a strategic shock because there is a level of ego and, as we said, uh, racism on the part of the US Navy and the US government when it comes to thinking about Pearl Harbor being attacked, for want of a better phrase. But the fact it could be done... Well, this had been being planned in from 1917 to 1918. That's why Sop with Cooker, etc. was being developed. So, to put that in context, that's 24 years before, uh, before Pearl Harbor and 23 years before Taranto. 
Nearly two and a half decades? How is that a shock that any Navy can do that? I was asking, destroyed oil reserves can stick fleet to harbour, similar ways hitting them directly. Biggest mistake in Pearl Harbor is not launching further attack in the tanks. Uh, considering the way the US Air Force, uh, the US Army Air Corps fighters were waking up, that would probably have been also a way to get themselves a lot of them hurt. It's an interesting scenario if you can avoid that. But, um, yeah, hitting the oil reserves. You also have to remember the Italian Navy was always short of oil. Always short of oil. So taking out their largest oil reserves in the harbour, which was the furthest south, is a problem for them. Good evening, Andrew Cox. That's good. I think one of the reasons the USN naval fighters were single seat in regards to F4F and f 6 f is that it would be working alongside two seat aircraft that would be able to guide them. Yeah. Gahaman, that explains swordfish only and keeping the fighters back. Yeah, it, it, in the nicest way. If you've now, if you're down from two carriers to one carrier, so you're taking less aircraft with you overall. It's also kind of interesting to think about what would have been ever able if HMS Ark Royal had been part of the strike package rather than illustrious, because she had skewers as part of her air group. That could have been interesting, because they could carry very big dive bombs. So. Yeah, that would have been very interesting for the Italians. Mm. And the other thing, of course, as I've been over several times that comes from World War One and features, features into this, is the second Royal Navy frustration. Because one, they are frustrated that the German high seas fleet stays in fricking harbour. Two, they get away at night. So as far as the Royal Navy is concerned, they will be able to fight at night, and they will be able to fight at night well, and by the time it gets to sort of the late 1930s, they've realised that no one else has specialised in this as much as them. The Japanese are next in line. The USN seem to be a distant third in comparison, and everyone else is behind that, and a long way behind that. And the Royal Navy's going... Oh, yeah, we've got an offset strategy, although they don't call it an offset strategy. So you have these two strands come from Royal, uh, from Model 1's frustrations. People go, the Royal Navy is preparing to fight Jutland again. No. But the frustration from Jutland about night fighting, oh, boy, did that build into things. And the frustration of the fleet hiding in harbour, oh, there are parliamentary committees. There are all sorts of things which feature into this. This, it's one of the reasons why the swordfish is selected over the Blackburn shark is because it's slightly more reliable and it's slightly easier to fly and slightly more stable. These are very marginal things, but when you're talking about a night flying, a long-range night torpedo attack, oh yeah, those small factors build up. And that's what they're going for. Stefan Padang, didn't the RN plan an attack on the high seas fleet by CV in spring of 1919? They were planning on doing it in late 1918. They were hoping to get there quite soon. We'll be guessing into what the ship they were going to use. Ian Carr, rockets on the swordfish would have been a nice addition to the party of Toronto, but well for the future. They would have been a nice addition. Austin Arman, thank you for the Iron Brew Fund. That's very kind of you. All Super Chats are greatly appreciated, especially at the moment. Iron Brew Fund is critical to getting me through quite a lot of stuff at the moment. Right, and... Inca, who invented the aerial torpedo? Well, considering that's the first flying torpedo bomber, guess who invented the aerial torpedo? It was the British. There are various names involved in it, but basically the British get into it first. They first off tried using a destroyer torpedo, and they work out that doesn't work, so they start making it work better. 
And that's part of the problems. As you can see, carrier which was used in the attack on Taranto. The proposed carrier for the attack on Wilhelmshaven of the German, uh, the um, 1918, late 1918, early 1919 attack. Please do notice a small difference. Just a small issue. You noticed it yet? Yeah. That one has a superstructure in the middle of its flight, in the middle of its deck. Yeah. And a funnel. And lots of other things. Armored flight deck? No idea. Hello, Lucas Jesuch. Dan Freeman, I prefer to think what might have happened if poor Courageous and or Glorious had not been lost and had been present to join the party. Ooh, that would also have been fun. But again, they would have had an air group which probably would have included some skewers. So again, you'd have had more swordfish, you'd have had skewers, you'd have had probably some full Mars go along. The strikes could have been far bigger. Can't Donald Daniel. According to Drakenfell's uh, Jutland video, which does feature me, thank you. Some of the ships late in the battle were barely able to make four or five knots slower than rated speed. Yeah, that the, the soil, uh, the coal quality Germany had in Model One was not great. There again, the fuel quality they had in Model Two wasn't that brilliant either. That's what hitting the oil tanks at Pearl Harbor would have been a, an irritation to USN. The USN would have had to run tankers from LA and San Diego to Pearl, but it's manageable. It's manageable, but it is an extra limitation on their efforts until they get the things rebuilt. Jemak, the RN don't want to fight Jutland again. They want to win Jutland this time. Mm, they want more than a strategic victory. Carl Harman, did Italy use Taranto after the attack? Not really. Basically, single units. That's what we get into as it goes on. They don't use it from a large fleet operation again. They pretty much withdraw to Naples immediately. And even though they start working on defences, they never... They never trusted as a major base again. There are individual units will be there, but not nothing large. Not an entire fleet again, because it was just... Yeah... Not good. Tom Fano, here we go again. You've got tactical victory and strategic victory. Yeah. Hello, old Richard. Jeff Hewlett, the RN sinks a Turkish ironclad with an aerial torpedo mode one. I think so. Although there are some people who theorize that that thing struck a mine. So this is why I'm sort of... Mm, I'm probably going to go with the torpedo. Kaham, Royal Navy preparing for new, improved, and more favourable Jutland in modern ways. It's more a case of the Royal Navy going, we would like to do Copenhagen again. How do we do a new Copenhagen with new technology? Give me Copenhagen. I want Copenhagen. I want to Copenhagen the enemy. This is the Royal Navy when it comes to developing naval aviation. Austin Hammond, at what point does achieving a tactical victory at sea translate into overall strategic victory? When you can actually carry out your naval maritime strategy with success, with a goodly chance of the enemy either not interfering or not being able to interfere to stop prevent you. Ron Cash, let's face it, the pilots on World War I Furious would have to be damn good at steering. Yes, they would. They would have to be very good at many, many things.
Inquisitor, Inquisitor the Jackknife. Hello. I'm presuming you're a Star Wars fan. Um, either that or a fan of a certain period of history. Alternatively, could be a plan of one of Terry Pratchett books as well. Anyway, uh, the USN had a shortage of t tankers in the Pacific well into 42. Losing the stores of oil on Hawaii would have been massively disrupted operations to respond to Japanese attacks. Yes. And would have made the stores of oil and fuel in Australia even more important than they were. As it was, they basically managed to provide the operational capacity for most of World War II Southeast Asia and South Pacific operations. David Bond. So I guess the planes drive on the left side of the superstructure in the fleet air arm? Uh, <laughs> I don't want to know. I don't want to think about it. I honestly, uh, the pilots who landed and took off from HMS Furious must have been brave. Very brave. Jess Beeler, HMS Furious, if you are removing a turret and adding a flight deck aft, why not remove the bridge and mast and tip the funnel over to one side? Any good sources? Um, Honestly, because they already had the structure built and they were trying to get her into service as quickly as possible, and they didn't realize they were going to need a, fr a full flight deck, a full-length flight deck. They just don't need it. They're basically developing carriers as they go along, and eventually they get it right, as Brecken Kennel says. Carl Gasman, HMS Ben Mysheri was a seaplane tender who sucked with Type 860, sunk the first ship by Aero Table Edo. Yeah. Ah, oh, Ben Mysheri. She was the one who had the fire, which made the Royal Navy really, really cautious when it came to its uh, fuel management systems. Thomas Vanwell, RN, British RN had a clear cut uh, strategic goal starve Germany into capitulation, period. Germany is no real strategic exec, naval, uh, strategic exec, executive except running blockade, in which they failed. I would say their objective is the same as the British one, to try and uh, strangle the British and to starve the British into submission. Uh, they don't, uh, you know, the British have a small advantage in doing that. Dan Freeman, do we need to use air quotes around the stuff German Navy was using one one to power their ships? Coal, not coal? Uh, not quite. It's, it's a form of coal. Dan Raganem, how to do Copenhagen again? Fight the Danes? Tempting. Bring on. Every unobserved torpedo attack is declared a mine. Just ask the submarine services of all navies who can't get confirmed. <laughs> yeah. Can't guess. Well, in 1991, RN links helicopters with CSQ missiles. Copenhagen, the Iraqi missile boat fleet. Yes. Basically, uh, the uh, Royal Navy gets to do Copenhagen occasionally again. They do like doing it. Copenhagening is a verb. Um, there is a whole video I've done about that one, Andrew Cox. To Copenhagen, your enemy. Gahan, what stage is the RN in now with fleet aviation if ordered to is Copenhagen? Well, uh, let's see. We then went through our escort period. Well, we went through our strike period, which was still all about Copenhagen and the enemy and repeating Matapan. And then we got into our escort slash support period. And now with the F-35s coming in back in and the talks about all sorts of things, I'm reckoning Copenhagen is coming back in fashion. <sighs> Aviator Enterprise, taking off is easy. Landing on Furious would have been scary. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> In car, Ohio might not have been available for multi service if the tanks at Pearl Harbor had been destroyed. That is one of the issues. Bolivar, hello. Ben Macri. It's Manx Gallic. Thank you. Uh, 
Andrew Cox, I can't help thinking Furious must have been the start of a long, long line of madly brave pilots for the RN. Potentially. Um, as you can see, the first strike target has just come up next to me and versus the uh, versus Taranto. One will notice that when the Royal Navy is thinking of Wilhelmshaven, they're actually thinking of a far more confined space than even Taranto. Taranto is fairly confined in naval terms, but compared to Wilhelmshaven, it's even less. Uh, it's even tight. Uh, it's even tighter. Oops, sorry. Uh, press the mute button. I think, or the mute came on. Anyway, Wilhelmshaven is smaller, but it's so it's narrower and more confined. But it's actually also slightly deeper than Taranto. Taranto has quite a flat bottom, whereas at Wilhelmshaven, the it sort of tapers off a bit quite quickly and then goes down a bit more. So it's an interesting scenario in that Wilhelmshaven is actually, in many ways. Easier, but also more difficult than Taranto. It's now working. That's good. Right. Um, Abazaski, dropping a tactical nuke on naval base will be Copenhagen Extreme. Yes, but viable. But we shouldn't probably do it. Uh, Seven Panang. So to prevent the Chinese Navy to invade Taiwan, we just ch Copenhagen and import. That'd be the best way. Stop leaving port. <sighs> Make sure you have proof about what they're going to do, though, before you do it. Then it's justified on the international things. It's called a preemptive strike. And um, breaking down. I think Wilhelm Stephen is deeper. Part of the complacency of the Italians is they thought the harbour was too shallow. Yes and no. Uh, it is too shallow for most navies. For most navies, Wilhelmshaven, in fact, for every navy other than the Royal Navy, Taranto would be too shallow for them to attack with their, their current aerial technology. And in fact, if the Japanese had had the British aerial torpedo technology, then Pearl Harbor would have been a lot, lot worse for the Americans. Algar, they were landing stop with camels and snipes on World War One Furious, weren't they? Yes, although they also planned to land some cuckoos on her. Hello, St. Kit, and hello, Peter Colding. Hello, Fury Kitten. I don't think I've seen you before, Fury Kitten. Hello. Uh, let's see. Did I do it? Oh, Brock Payne. Did the attacks on Vichy French ports after the armistice count as lead ups to Toronto? Yes, they do. But they weren't really as well implemented as they could have been. I think if um, a certain Cunningham had been in charge of them rather than a nicer Somerville, they probably would have been implemented slightly harder. 
and slightly more uh, <clears throat> devastatingly. Uh, as for old Richard, I think China might see Copenhagen as an essential threat requiring nuclear response. Depends. If you don't take out their land-based nuclear weapons and you just take out their fleet and don't invade them, well, they might not. Remember their land power. The sea is a bonus. Dirt Scott, if Wilhelmshaven had dock gates, would torpedoing the dock gates cause them to jam or block the entrances, trapping the high sea fleet in harbour to be bombed, torpedoed at leisure? Oh, trust me, they were thinking of that one, and uh, they would have had a go at that as well. Ah, Fury Kitten, I have been on and off for quite a while. Well, I haven't seen you recently. Uh, I think you've changed your um, symbol. You've got a poppy there now, and I've forgotten my poppy again today, but, you know... I, the trouble is, I put my poppy on my coat to go out and walk the dog, and then I forget to take it off and put it on and transfer it to my t-shirt. Andrew Cox. The Luftwaffe did not hit the Duke, uh, the uh, hit Iron Duke in Scarpa. No. Do the Russians worry about us port offering their base in Kalingrad? Um, probably. Let's see, Ian Carr. Ian Carr, Germans never tried a Taranto style raid on Scapa Flow with their HE 111 torpedo planes. No, but British have radar fighters and it's a very long range. Okay, it's a very long way for them to get there, even from Norway. And also, it's going to sound strange, but. The British were fighting a global war, and this is one of the points I get into with a lot of people who then go, oh, the British weren't strong because they don't deploy a massive fleet to the Eastern Fleet or a massive land battleships here, there, or anywhere in the world. The British are fighting a whole a global war, which means their forces tend to be based in spread out areas and only concentrate for operations. And when they concentrate, it's at sea, it's not in harbour. So whereas the Italians, out of their six battleships, had... X number in the harbour at Taranto, and let me just check, I have that listed here. The Italian Navy at Taranto had all six of their battleships. They had nine heavy cruisers. They had seven light cruisers and 13 destroyers, all concentrated in one harbour. The Royal Navy in World War II would never have done that at any point. Potentially the British Pacific Fleet, but even then they didn't do it that way. They tried to spread them out amongst different harbours. It's just not. It's not the sort of the, the the British do not present the same target that the Italians do at Taranto. Plus, as Carl McGas would point out, the Germans were rather aware of the existence of British radar by nineteen forty. And certainly by 1941, after you process the ideas of what happened at Taranto, uh, the Italian radar didn't exist, and they had aerial listening systems, which is quite an interesting thing. Inca, any plans for a Sinsair style raid on Wilhelmshaven? Mm, not at this point in World War II. Odd Richard, did the FAA rehearse operations like Taranto in detail, similar to the Kido Bataille practicing for Pearl Harbor? No. They practice the skills in many other ways, but they don't rehearse the, de the operations in detail. They're given the operational plan. They're given a construction, um, a, a Play-Doh construction often, or something similar, of the port to study. That's prepared by the intelligence department, department. And that's it. 
The Royal Navy do not manage the dude. This is also, here's the thing. The Kido Batai, uh, Kido Batai are preparing for Pearl Harbor in peacetime. They are the entire it, in Japanese fleet, virtually. All their carriers, everything. Taranto is being conducted by one, possibly it was, it was planned for two carriers, but ended up being one carrier of the Mediterranean fleet, which is a portion of the Royal Navy. It's not the Royal Navy gathering every single aircraft carrier they had, because if they could have gathered all the aircraft their carriers they had because of peacetime, I doubt there would have been a single Italian battleship which would have left Taranto able to ever float again. Because if you imagine, if HMS Illustrious had been able to, let's say it had been peace and the Royal Navy been launching this attack in 1940 and it was peace up until then and the British were doing a preemptive strike like Pearl Harbor, they could have had Ark Royal there, they could have had Illustrious there, they could have had Eagle there because she wouldn't have been going through war, she wouldn't have been bombed, she wouldn't have had her things damaged. They could well have had Courageous or Glorious there. You could have been talking about a strike package instead of being 20 aircraft, of being 120, 200 aircraft. Instead of the Italian air defences being full alert and prepared for war, they might well have been in peacetime operation and had hardly anything manned. Would they have had all the barrages out, all the barrage balloons, all those things up? No. Because they all cost money and you don't do it unless you need to. Might not have even had all the torpedo nets out. There is a big difference between conducting an operation in peacetime and conducting it in war. In terms of what's available. And in terms of how much preparation you can do. Hancox, I set corrected. Luftwaffe damaged Iron Duke in scalpel with near misses. Hmm. Yeah, but they're chasing after that. We won't get into that. Well, I. Yeah, but I didn't think that. I thought that was mines, not torpedoes. Hmm. Ow. The Italians only had seven heavy cruisers. The Garibaldi's don't count unless you call the towns heavies. Eh, yeah, the Italians called them. Then from the Iron had this strange belief that ships belonging at sea rather than in harbour. They do. Okay, let me just look up my list of the Italian fleet there. They had Trento, Trieste, Balza, Zara, Fium, Pola, Gozia, San Giallo. And I think they had. Mm. Hmm. I'm not sure what's listed. I got it from I think I got it from my book. Hmm. I'll go hunted down. But they had pretty much the whole fleet there. And that's the problem. Hmm. I think I know what they're clouting. Hmm. 
Hmm, I wonder. Hmm. Let's see. Mm. Regan, I'm surprised they had all their ships in Toronto, though. Usually their second squadron, or at least the heavy cruiser squadron, was elsewhere. No, this is one of the reasons why Taranto was quite so interesting to the Royal Navy at this point. They were gathered all there. Mainly because they were... How do I put this? Plan, um, basically trying to keep the Royal Navy away from their invasion of Greece, as Dan Dream has pointed out. Lukashish, Wilhelmshaven is a very long, deep, narrow harbour. If I remember correctly from last time, it was easy to defend against aircraft. Not considered so in World War I, but there again, aircraft had only really just come into service, so no one really had defences, worked out their defences against aircraft in World War I. Inca, every t uh, every, even the wartime RN med fleet was split between Alexandria and Gibraltar. Yes. Force H, ah, Brecken Kendall, okay. So actually, Force H is part of the Mediterranean fleet. It's technically supposed to cover the Western Mediterranean and the Atlantic and can be able to go both ways. But technically, Somerville does answer the Cunningham. And as this fleet operation goes, and the whole operation Toronto does go, you have various things going on because... Technically, this all the whole of Taranto takes place during Operation Mike Brover Ete, which is there is a convoy from Port Said to Crete, there is a convoy MW3 uh, from Alexandria to Malta, uh, there is Force H and Air Force F uh, out of Gibraltar. Uh, and doing their attacks, which involves Operation Coat, Ark Royal, sending nine swordfish bombers to uh, swordfish aircraft to bomb Cagliari Air Base, uh, and also they transfer three full Mars to Illustrious via Malta to help support the air defences of the main task group going to attack Taranto. Um... Then Forces H... Force F does a, that is based around a battleship and managed to dash through. I've got the details for the various forces somewhere in my notes. That's you know, it's a it's a whole thing. And Force S F is a dash of um, several freighters, including Ramley, uh, several ships, including Ramley's, Ajax, and the Sydney. Um, go through, uh, get out, uh, go through. The Malta, uh, the Straits of Malta, and there is a whole thing going on. It's not just you always have to remember. Taranto is not just Taranto; it's typical Cunningham in that the poor Italians are going. There's this attack up on Genoa. There's the Royal Navy going through there and trying to get a battleship from the. Western Mediterranean into the Eastern Mediterranean to reinforce Cunningham. There is just so much going on. And Toronto takes place after they've done this. So, the, you know, the Italian fleet thinks everything's over, think the British have accomplished their goals and are gone back home. And actually, there is something else coming. Anonymous. Uh, the Italians also called their medium tanks mediums. Uh, Anonymous. H M1340, 47 millimeter cannon routes. Mm. Carmen. Taranto was an, was an attack. It was a naval total wipeout. 
entire reserving fleet was that they were thinking that uh, mm, not really, but uh, it was a, a fairly there was a lot of air defense, and honestly, I love this painting because it highlights that there was a lot of air defense. So, Patrick, were the San Giorgio and San Marco also in harbor? They were armored cruisers, but in 1940, only coastal defense ships. Possibly that's the heavier, extra heavy cruiser they're talking about. That's good. Basing the Italian fleet in Toronto, uh, Toronto also makes sense. Uh, uh, makes them a threat to anything moving in the Mediterranean. If they are further up, the RN might or, or might be able to run lighter escort convoys. That is part of the why they're there. Interesting enough, you've got all this movement going on, all these fleet actions, and all these various movements. The Italian fleet don't come out. So this is the thing. If the Italian fleet had come out to attack the British passing a battleship through the Straits of Malta, an R-class battleship, the idea was for Force H to come south and attack them from behind with a carrier strike, illustrious to do a carrier strike on them, and the Royal Navy to basically run Matapan earlier in, in 1940. But the Italians stayed in harbour, en masse, thinking, you know what, the Ger this worked for the Germans in World War I, we'll do it now. The Royal Navy going, you won't! You won't! In car, who was in command of the Taranto raid? Cunningham and Lister assisting him? Pretty much. Cunningham is at sea with his forces, but Lister is in the carrier. Anonymous. For one, last time we learned the UK fights global wars from periphery. In two, this time we learn it penny packets units. Why the small time approach? Not it's not small time. It's the case of if you're fighting a global war and you have all your fleet in one place, you're no longer fighting a global war. The idea is if you take out as much of the enemy as you can, so you only require a minimal force to deal with them, you can maximize your force in elsewhere where so you haven't managed to do that to your enemy. So that's the whole point of Taranto, to reduce the requirements in the Mediterranean so you can concentrate where you need to concentrate your forces. You concentrate where you need to, and where you don't need to, you have a minimal force there to deter issues or deal with anything which will flare up lightly. Rank out. San Marco was in Tobruk. San Giorgio might have been, as she was part of the force gathered to attack Corfu. Yeah. Aga, how did Britain fight World 1 from periphery? They did not do so. Uh, well, let's see. Their first thing is to blockade Germany, send in supplies to France and troops to France, but also start taking out the German colonies around the world and quickly mops up the German colonies and any German forces outside of the European theatre so they can concentrate. It's not fighting from the periphery, it's take out the periphery and then deal with the centre. Basically, it's a sensible thing to do because it then secures your trade, secures your economic action, so your economic economy can continue as, as well as it possibly can, and your enemies is reduced. It's basically how you fight a long war. Carl Harmon, had Italy come out to play and their ammo been reliable, who would win in a, fi a fleet battle, day results and night results? Well, let's put it this way. So, the Italians come out. If it's a battleship versus battleship battle at day, well, they probably win. If it's a battleship versus battleship battle at night, then the British have a very good chance. But why are the British going to play fair? They have aircraft carriers, the Italians don't you can guarantee they're going to be getting in some strikes with torpedo bombers and other aircraft as quickly as they can on those ships. They're going to do their best to push them down, to whittle them, damage them, slow them, everything they can, like they did at Matapan. And Cunningham's going to do his best to make sure any fighting he can takes place at night. 
So on paper, they do quite well in the day. They might even win it. Mm, if it's just a battleship fight. If it's a full fleet on fleet fight, uh, they probably lose even in daytime. Because the British should probably choose not to fight, slow them down with air attacks, and then at night go in for them. Descott, Anonymous, all war is economic. If you can strangle the enemy's trade, you'll win. But the UK also based most major units at home or in the Med to stop the enemy fleets from operating freely. Yes, and also because if you have them in the Mediterranean, you can surge them to the Indian Ocean and into the Far East. Ian Carr, later Swordfish had a cannon pee, but Toronto version and that used against Bismarck were open wa uh, to wash off gasoline. And a few other things. It also gives you far better vision. Aga, nine, yes, you're talking about 1918, for example, Britain had 5 million troops in France, but that's the end of the war. At the beginning of the war, Britain's always approach to war is they start off by um, blockading the enemy and sometimes trying to pin the enemy in Europe, but then they take out the enemy's organizations and things around the rest of the world so that they can then focus in their resources. So that's why in World War I you have Sing Tao, you have all the fighting going on in Africa, you have all the fighting going on elsewhere. It start, it's really at the beginning of the war. And then by the end of the war, they are able to focus in just on Europe. Anyway, so, uh, so traditional war of commerce, good, of course, and Terence. That's pretty much it. It's the best one for the Britain, uh, Britain as a strategic system. Their squad. Uh, World, World War One, our army was by far the largest fleet in World War, World War in the world. The Great Fight was in the UK because flanked ship for ship, both sides by part of. Um, The RN would be embarrassing for the USN. Also because the RN had enough new dreadnoughts to make the USN look antiquated. Yeah. Ian Carr, have the RN plans for a name for their 35s? Can I pro swordfish? I think they could be called lightnings. Same as everyone else. Uh, Anos, I don't think we can, should take an attritional strategy approach against China because of their large population, low tech, asymmetric approach. Uh, not attritional, necessarily. Daniel Ganamak, why would you ever fight fair? You might lose something. Yep, pretty much. So, before we go much further, let's have a look at the aircraft. So, these are the two variants of the aircraft used. There's the flare dropper with bombs. There were some aircraft with even more bombs. And there were a lot of, there are a fair number of aircraft with torpedoes. And I actually think that aircraft in you can uh, that aircraft in the painting has probably just popped up to drop out uh, to drop the torpedo. Because it needs to be actually dropped from slightly higher than the swordfish was probably flying. Remember, the Royal Navy has some interesting things on their swordfish. They have on their torpedoes going for their torpedo from their dropping from the swordfish. They have extra fins, some wooden panels to help them in terms of when they hit the water, and they have a tension wire to keep their nose up, which means that it's going to sound strange. It's a combination of both, which means that their torpedoes, instead of when they hit the water because they have quite a heavy nose, hitting the water and going, and then writing, the British ones do... They belly flop. Britain does a lot of work to make sure its torpedo bomber, its torpedoes belly flop. They have an unfair advantage in a way, in that they started early than everyone else, but they also noticed quite early on 
that torpedo bombers, torpedoes tend to belly flop. Because when you're looking at harbour attacks, that's important. When, you're, when your entire plan is about using your torpedo bombers primarily for an attack at sea, you don't worry about them belly flopping. It doesn't matter if they have to go down and come up. It doesn't matter to you. If you're thinking about attacking in harbour, though, just as irrelevant as attacking at sea, suddenly that manoeuvre becomes very problematic because that manoeuvre means they go deep, which is why I say really no other navy could have done Taranto in 1940 than the Royal Navy because no other navy really had torpedoes which would go shallow enough to operate in Taranto. And also why I say if that it been Royal Navy technology being used by the Japanese at Pearl Harbor, the Americans would have lost far, far more ships because the Japanese, lots of Japanese torpedoes end up burying themselves in the mud, in the surface, in the bed of Pearl Harbor. It's one of the things which the Americans do get right. It's very difficult. If they've been facing the Royal Navy, though, oh, good God, because you start to realize that A, well, the Royal Navy torpedo bombers run at something like 50% kill rate in that they take out three of the water battleships out of six there. So three of six taken off the board. Roughly 12 of the 20 aircraft that hit uh, to attack the Pearl Heart uh, attack at Taranto are torpedo bombers, and roughly six hits are scored. Imagine those odds at, at Pearl Harbor. Imagine that taking place at Pearl Harbor. Yowza! Considering the numbers of aircraft the Japanese were employing. But we'll talk more about that later. There is a huge weight of AA fire. You, you cannot understand, uh, begin to comprehend how much anti-aircraft fire there is available at Toronto. If we consider it, there are... Uh, yeah, if we go to this plan again and we expand it. So I'm going to disappear for a second. Now, the Royal Navy have been planning various sort of uh, permutations of this operation for a long, long time. But really, it starts the 1930s. It starts to hot up, and in nine, especially during the Abyssinian Crisis, they have a good quality of it on it. Now, the fact is, you have got a harbour which is all these islands have been fortified with anti-aircraft fire. There are barges strung around and positioned in the harbour which have anti-aircraft weapons on them. They have barrage balloons, they have AA defense of the ships, everything. <clears throat> and it's not just the Mar, Pic uh, Mar Grand, there's also uh, ships in the Mar Piccolo. So there is a large fleet concentrated here. And it's got defenses all around, and those ships are going to be offering a lot of firepower. Right then. I also think, and this is very much off the topic for Taranto, that Sun Tzu can be overemphasized as terms of Chinese war theory. He's very popular, very, very popular in terms of our analysis of China, not necessarily so popular in Chinese actual military thought.
Anos, uh, Dirt Squad, USN has always put the emphasis on superior quality, literally since the US and Britain had a bit of disagreement around 1775. Not really. They do tend to, but the quality they're referring might not necessarily be superior quality. It's, it's superior quality in terms of what they want to get them out of them. Uh, the, it's a quality that the paint is contextual. Nick Waters, looks old, but not your daddy's biplane. No. That's not your daddy's biplane. That's a very good biplane in 1940. In 1939, 1940, I would argue possibly uh, the best value for money and the best, uh, the best strike aircraft available because they've been in service long enough for their crews to be really, really, really good at them. And they were able to do things with their torpedoes, which no one else could do. And if you're going for a torpedo bomber, that's what you want. Juno one I aren't. Hello, Juno. Did they have magnetic detonators too? Detonators too? Yes, and they worked. Mostly. Kung Asma, weren't those wooden fins adopted and shown in Tora Tora Tora? And the Japanese had already been working on wooden fins. When they found pieces of wood in the water at Taranto Do, which looked like fins, they did pick them up and think, oh, this proves that it works. No one found the tension wires. They were just extra pieces of cable in the water. No one know, thought where they came from or what they were or really even picked them up and noticed them. So no one noticed the second part of the process. Hmm. Right. And on us, Japan modified its torpedoes and tackles specifically to be able to hit Pearl. That they did. But they'd been started working on this probably in 1938. Aviator 70, uh, Aviator Nebraska, Dr. Luck, do you mean damage inflicted by? West Virginia took six torpedoes and was salvaged. Yes. But, again, in the nicest way, um, in the facts here, <sighs> the Japanese launched 355 aircraft against Hawaii. The Royal Navy launched 21 against Taranto. So... In the nicest way, if you're going to... Uh, the, the sheer number of torpedoes which actually hit in terms of percentage-wise, because let's be honest, it, it, they do not run at 50% targets. There are not so many aircraft getting torpedoes, and there are not so many... It, it's a very different scenario in terms of the ratio of accuracy. I got it. Naval, yes, Dr. Lab, but when it comes to the actual army, World War I was not fought peripherally, bro. I Algar, you're having a you seem to be having a whole discussion with me over this one. Okay, so let's get into this. Uh, if you want to bring up World War One in the middle of a Taranto debate Taranto discussion, uh <sighs> Yes and no, because if you consider the size of the Indian Army and the size of the other land forces in, available to Britain, and are those from Australia, Canada, etc., you'll find that there's quite a large number of troops deployed elsewhere in the world. So whilst, yes, a very large army does end up being, by 1918, and at various points in the war, it's growing, in terms of Britain's naval and global strategy, it's not that dissimilar to the Napoleonic Wars. It, it, the idea that it isn't comes out of the very heavy focus on the Western Front by a lot of the histories. But once you start looking around, you start going, oh, they were doing this, and this, and this, and this, and this, and this. Okay. Mm
Brad Payne, so in history, has there ever been a navy which understood how to beat the Royal Navy and come anywhere close to doing it? Mm, the French won occasionally a few battles. And, you know, uh, people win battles. It's winning a war versus the British. That's the trouble. That's the problematic thing. Trent McCartney, were any of the three sunk battleships raised in return to service? Two were. Two return to service. Eventually. One didn't. Uh, Connor Zad, greetings from unseasonably warm New England. <laughs> I know, Hickam, sorry. Well, if we're counting both waves of the British, we have to count the both waves of the Japanese in Toronto and Pearl Harbor. Okay. Hmm. Andrew Cox, didn't the Iron learn the importance of Tracer? Lisa Toronto, Tran Principal, or lost their real Uh The British didn't like Tracer because it revealed your position at fighting at night. If they could, they would use Tracer, and they did use Tracer, but let's be honest, the big reason Prince of Wales and Repulse were lost is because they had no air cover, and they weren't really that good at coordinating aircraft. If you'd had a carrier out there, you'd have had a different scenario, but that's a whole different question and a whole different thing. Hmm. Okay, okay, Taranto kill versus rate versus Pearl. But at a glance, the RN could have salvaged their ship more than the ones in Pearl, except that Pearl was left alone after the attack. Our, our RM could have salvaged. Yeah, Pearl is left alone, and Taranto really isn't that bothered as much either, but the RM managed to salvage two out of three. One is just beyond it. Can I replan and Sun Tzu? Probably Gorshkov is more influential, albeit we do not know what Ewa looks like in practice and how the Chinese are using it. Mm, I would agree on that. I got Navy. Alga, navally, I agree. War was fought by British in more or less traditional matter for British, but when it comes to land battle, it was very untraditional. No, again, it's not untraditional. It's just that usually Britain hires more mercenaries to do its land fighting on the ground. But it didn't naturally. Again, there's the Peninsula campaign, and then there's the fight into France against Napoleon. It's not unusual. You start off, and then you get there. It's how you do it. Mm. Night Heron Productions, 1940s aircraft. The age of the biplane is dead. Swordfish, unfold my wings. Eh. More like spin my propeller. Ian Carl, seems fairly miraculous from reports that amongst the, uh, the hits, Vittorio Veneto was not torpedoed. Yes, she does seem to leave a miraculous life. She almost gets hit by about three torpedoes, if any one of them had managed to. And there is, again, the advantage you have if you're in Pearl Harbor. The, Italian, the Americans are in Battleship Row, which means if your torpedo diverts either way or the other, it will likely hit another target. Whereas in... Taranto, because of the way the battleships were play spaced around, they weren't all next to each other. So once you were locked on a target, that was your target. You couldn't really alter. Oh, Richard, would you say the mission of NATO Standing Force Naval, uh, Naval Force Europe is to Taranto, the CIS, 
battle fleet in an event of war, Bolt, a Baltic fleet in World War, or pursue uh, logistics targets? Uh, it's probably logistics. Protect them. Jeff Hiller, why was the RN unable to pull off another Taranto? Well, partially because no one was killing, no one concentrated enough. But they did try other Tarantos, and they did have some successes. They just weren't able to pull off a Taranto-style Taranto because people didn't concentrate enough for them to do it, or they were positioned in the nicest way. When you have the Italian Navy pull back to Naples or pull back far, far closer and far further north, so it's far more difficult to get close to them without the air attacks being able to see them, you know, it's a problem. Hmm. said, how can the USN save the number of battleships as museums, but not the British? Uh, money. Always money. John, good evening. I like thinking of Taranto Pearl comparison of what the RN could have done with 350 aircraft. Also, what they would continue to do after they got the blow-in. Uh, <laughs> As I said earlier, it, it's going to be strange. If the people go, oh, the RN couldn't have arranged that carriers. They could have organized those carriers if it had been peacetime. If you think about it, if 1940 had been peace for the Royal Navy... And they would have been, and they'd been launching Tack Out Blue. They could have gathered Ark Royal. They could have taken courageous, glorious, furious, illustrious. They could have got very, very close to 350 aircraft if there'd have been peacetime, but it wasn't. So their carriers were off doing the duties they needed to do around the world. So they were going with what was available to carry out the operation. So this is the difference between carrying out an operation in wartime versus carrying out an operation in peacetime. Because de facto, Pearl Harbor, whilst it starts the war, is carried out in peacetime. When else can you concentrate your forces so? It's brilliant. I can concentrate. The, one would argue, actually, the Italian, uh, the Japanese never really get out of the peacetime mentality of concentrating their forces. And that's why they have the battles they do in World War II and all these things. Because it's always a concentrated mass of force. That allows the Americans to concentrate as well. Whereas if they'd been spreading them out and moving them around, they'd have made the Americans have to keep sending out penny packets and they could have actually taken them out probably at some point. Bandholm. Hi, Alex. How far had the swordfish evolved and laid airplanes in Model 1? Oof. They had far more reliable engines for starters, and they had a lot more dials in the cockpit. No, don't want that to spare. Want this to expand. So here's the damage assessment, and this is courtesy of Jamie from Armored Carriers. So the Contiver de Caver is damaged beyond repair. The Torio and Ciodolio are damaged but repairable. They, it's a few months. Seaplane facilities are heavily damaged. And of course, this is on top of the seaplane facilities which have been damaged by the lovely HMS Ark Royal with her strikes. So that means a lot of the reconnaissance av capabilities available to the Regia Marina are taken out. Okay, they don't exist at this point. They have to be rebuilt. The Italians do a lot of firepower. 1,430 12.5 centimeter rounds. That's 125 millimeter rounds. Uh, 313 107 millimeter rounds. 6,854 88 millimeter rounds. 2,635 20 millimeter rounds. 931 40 millimeter rounds. And let's go over this because here's what people often forget. The Italians were at war fighting condition, just as the Royal Navy. At this point, they always have half their AA guns manned. 24 hours a day. And at dawn and dusk, they are there all fully manned. So, yes, that does mean that once you're doing that, and especially at night, and you've been doing it for a few weeks, your operational preparation might deteriorate. You might have a few people catching a few winks, etc., when the officers can't see them. But 
it does mean everything's prepped. This is, again, not like Pearl Harbor. There is a very large amount of people who are very ready for the attack. There's no one off on a Sunday morning siesta. But, surprisingly, this, and this actually might also explain why, again, so few people are killed, is that there are just 23 people killed aboard Littorio, 16 on the Contacivor, and one aboard Caedulia. Now, And, of course, they lose so much fuel. It's absolutely absurd. Taranto was really, really overstuffed strategically, but you can understand why for their operations, but, you know. Brent Kennel. Mm, yeah, preferring sh ships is expensive. Even the American ones struggle for cash. Yes, even HMS Belfast struggles for cash. We've preserved her, and then there's Caroline, M1, and HMS Victory, of course. Juno 1 Island. Couldn't the British follow up the torpedo attack by ship bombardment? They would have had air superiority for a bit and more damage to the iron. No. Well, they <clears throat> let's put it this way. The thing is, if you move close enough for a bombardment by the battleships, which would have done a tremendous amount of damage, you would still only have the number of fighters you do to protect them getting off. Now, uh, aboard Illustrious, and that would have been a lot more air attacks. So, what the Brit uh, the thing is, if the Royal Navy had been able to, I don't know, combine Ark Royal and Illustrious, and the number of fighters they could have brought, and maybe Eagle as well then maybe they would have thought they had enough fighters and enough air defense to be able to do that. But there again, they'd also had enough strike power that the requirements of actually doing the battleship attack would probably be nil. But instead, they had to use HMS Ark Royal for the distraction operation. They didn't have the burn around. That could be something useful for her to do. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's Atrium's Warrior as well. I forgot her doesn't save the aircraft, they save ships. Andrew Cox, how on earth did they expend more 88mm than 20 and 40mm combined? I have no idea, but I'm it's the medium gun mainly being used aboard the ship, so I presume they're blasting away with that as much as they can. Plus, shore guns, as Brecken Kendall's pointed out. And they were worried about shooting low for, for rear, fear of raking their own ships. This is something we don't. Uh, you have to, you cannot overestimate. Again, the thing is, again, this is another advantage the U.S. Navy actually has at Pearl Harbor in that they can fortify all their guns because they're not worried about hitting each other because they're in a nice line. When you're hickledy pickledy like the Italians were at Taranto, uh, then you can you have to worry about hitting the town. You have to worry about hitting everyone else. You just have to worry about hitting everything. So this is also one reasons why the sawfish were going so, uh, so perfect for them because they they are narrow. They are short enough wingspan to fit between the barrage balloons, and B they can fly so low and slow enough that they can actually go below the flak level. And this is what some of the attacks would lead, would read about. And I'll get out about it in a second. In car, was there not a distraction high level raid from Malta prior to the Sol Solfish attack? No, there was a reconnaissance overflight early in the day. There was no raids from Malta. There weren't any bombers on Malta that could carry out a bombing, uh, bombing attack. Um, there were reconnaissance aircraft. John Luke, an RN Pearl Harbor attack is uh, is called the end of the war. 350 planes, the first blow gets Battleship Row, then carries, then cruisers, then send in some destroyers to rub salt in. Yeah, the, the, the tribal class would have probably gone in to say hello at that point, just to see it as anything less. Anna Filton, what was the light like? Full moon? Was Toronto backed out? It was full moon, 
Taranto wasn't as was blacked out to an extent, but it had enough lights on they did spot it. And once the flak and the AA went up, they made them very very visible. Have a nice little picture of Comte de Cavour and um Yeah Pearl Harbor. There for the comparisons. Inca, how many swordfish were planned to be used originally from Illustrious and Eagle? It would have been About 20, the, the idea was to have 24 on Illustrious and a further 12 to 18 of Old Eagle. So your original tack plan, if you consider that they would have probably still been the losses that were suffered on the way route there, they were losses of aircraft. There were three losses of aircraft. Let's say they still lose about four. You would probably have had about 36 to 38 aircraft involved in the strike. So you would have had an extra, probably an extra 12 torpedoes launched. And if you have an extra, if you double the number of torpedo bombers, because you don't need to increase the flare strikes, if you double the number of torpedoes in the water, considering the odds they achieved, that might well have been all six battleships damaged. I think what else? I'm getting visions of night footage of Baghdad. Yeah, just try it slightly worse. Garhaman, what's the Royal Navy's function in World War currently? Uh, are they essentially going to escort and protect USMC and top up with Royal Marines? Mm, no, probably not. Um, at the moment, it's if we were fighting the Russians, it's supporting the northern flank, that is Norway, etc., and escorting things across the world. If we're fighting the Chinese... Probably we'd slot in with the Australians in Southeast Asia and the Indian and possibly the Indians if they combine with us. Trent McCartney, was War Spider's renowned in her time as she was now? Yeah, she was fairly famous. Not as famous as Hood, but fairly famous at the time. Calvin Johnson, USN style Taranto, Operation Hailstone on Truck. Mm hmm. Jeff. Cavalier HLs have Cavalier Oslot and Gannet preserve the Chatham. Yes, and they all cost a lot to keep going. Jeff Peter, what were the important lessons learned from both sides? Did any of the aircrew go to on to bigger things? <laughs> they went on to a lot of bigger things. The Royal Navy Group, let's see. There is a great picture in this uh, book by Rag, Old Rag, which has them on. So, the various operations they go on to, and the survivors, what they become. Uh, there are about. I think it's about four admirals, many, many captains. They can't have that come out of it. The great thing about this is it has all the list. Uh, let's see. Uh, there is Caduceo, Alferi, Orani, Gebati, Fiume, Zara, Gozia, Caedulia, Caesar, Littorio, Littorio Venito, oh, no, Vittorio Venito, Andrea Dore, Volgare, Conte Gavo, Fulmi, uh, Lampo, Balena, Trento, Trieste, Bolza, and all sorts of things in the, in the fleet positioned around. 
And for this, the Royal Navy loses two aircraft. They lose two aircraft in the strike, and they take out three battleships, one permanently, two for six months. You know, that's not a bad return investment. Mm-hmm. John Luke, what is the feasibility of boarding actions in World War II? Do ships carry enough small arms for crew? Could an RN destroyer crew board, say, an Italian battleship ship and get anywhere? Uh, well, you've got the Altmark incident, of course, which does include a boarding. Um, probably not in officially, uh, but the, they, they, they were interested in it if they could have got away with it, but they're, you know, no, not usually. Not usually on a large, uh, from a small ship to a larger ship. They're usually marines or equivalent aboard. Do you know what I know? Clark, wasn't the uh, looks like wasn't the this fleet overpowered fleet? A, a, a war spite, Captain Manly Powers, Andrew Cunningham, and a god named Prince Philip. Plus, there are two tribal class destroyers in this group as well. Plus, HMS Illustrious and all sorts of other things. Um, yeah, the Mediterranean fleet is um, small but very capable. Andrew Cox, that what status were the Italian BBs at? I put all USN ships were at peacetime Sunday inspection status, so lots of watertight doors open. Uh, the Italians were at full wartime. Full wartime, as I said, they had their air defences manned 100% of the time. 50% uh, of, uh, of their AA was manned 100% of the time. So, yeah. And it went up to 100% at dawn and dusk. So, yeah, it's a very different fleet you're taking on. Um, how much did experience gained at Merzel Kabir influence Taranto tactics? Not really as much as you'd think, because honestly, it's not much more experience than what they've already been getting from their operations and their exercise in the interwar period. Tirpitz was a very different um, issue, as we pointed out, as is being pointed out. There are Tirpitz is sitting on her own and has a whole lot of things covering her from the walls of the fjord, and it's it's a very different strike package required. Trevor McCartney, I recently read that Jean Bart got quite lucky in her duel with Massachusetts. One of her sixteen you know, the sixteen shells that didn't even have an issue of its fuse exploded in an empty five inch magazine. Very lucky. Thomas Vanderbilt. An interesting estimate regarding the impact of V1 launches on London, Metrolinear, in terms of drop production in 44-45. This was a loss of 25% in man hours per worker. Uh, Antwerp, same story, but even a lot worse. Although direct destruction might have been absent, people that are woken up 20 times a night inevitably become exhausted over many years of this. Yep. Cardiff, uh, uh, Code Fat uh, uh, Fate 1990. Well, for starters, hello. Uh, why was Cadula's damage so bad that the Italian decided not to repair it? Pretty much because Cadulio managed to get hit quite so many times and because of where the flooding took place. Um. Even four days afterwards, that was the Littorio, still bows down. Uh, we I have another picture coming up of the Caedulio, which expl uh, which basically gives the example. There you go. There's the Caedulio. Her engines get water in them. Um, her whole uh, she basically to uh, to be uh, to be fixed. She'd have had to be re-engined, had her hull rebuilt, everything. It was just beyond. It was cheaper to build a new battleship than it was to repair her. That was the thing. You could repair her, but it was cheaper to build a new battleship than it was to repair her. Because you pretty much have to build a new battleship to repair her. Just have to fit it all the difficult things she already has. Hmm. 
Grand Cannon. Delia was repaired. Cavo a Conte de Cavo was being repaired, but they decided to do a full rebuild. Uh, electronic upgrades were due to finish in 44. Also building new escort ships was more urgent. Uh, no. Conte de Cavo, they... Uh, no. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Care Delia was repaired. Uh, about six months. Conte de Cavo wasn't, was the one that wasn't repaired. Sorry. Brain dying. But... Yeah. At no point... Uh, there are lots of the. Uh, there is always talk amongst the Italians. Oh, we'll repair her. We'll do this. We'll do that. They never actually do any work on her. It's so much more expensive than building a new battleship. That no, they're not. There are all sorts of discussions of it, but they don't do actual work because it costs so much. Some clips. Unfortunately, no second raid carry on Toronto. Didn't US tactics develop in the Pacific? Stress the importance of returning to hit targets a second time. Uh, well, you see, the point is, if you return a second time, they're all awake if you return the second night. So you can do that in the American tactics when you are going to do it. But also, here's the other little secret about Toronto. By the end of the day, to day after, so basically the attack takes place, and by the end of the next day, every Italian ship that could move is got out. So there's nothing more to attack there. Why would you attack an empty harbour? All you're going to do is hit the ships which have already been sunk. And you're risking a load of pilots, you're risking a load of people of your own fleet being attacked for what? To hit things which you already hit? Mm. Night Iron Production. Forgive us, sir, but this is always intriguing me. Sorry, long one. The aircraft in mind for this sort of question are the Mosquito and the Bristol Blue Fighter. Take a small squadron of planes, deploy them against the fleet either at sea or in port with rocket projectiles equivalent to the broadside of a six inch cruiser. How effective is the aircraft in being in such action? Uh, it always depends if they can actually get a hit on target. And that, again, depends on if there's a fight or anything nearby that's going to break up the attack. Alternatively, I can see them being used to cut down AA in port by ridding BB's superstructure while torpedo bombs do their thing. Your thoughts? That would probably be far more successful. And you could probably do that with a full mar after it be modified, or a flyer fly, definitely. As you can see, so this is, these images and all those reports are why whenever I see the reports, and I, Breck and I, Kendall, I will admit, the Japan, the Italians do talk about it always. They talk about the electronic fit they're going to fit, the air defense fit they're going to fit, and all these things. Actually doing it, they don't do anything, because Conte de Cavour is just, no. She has been tremendously damaged. And salt water does a lot of damage. Basically, they need would need to rebuild her entire engine. If what you have to remember is here, she is sat on the bottom of the harbor. If the harbor had been any deeper, she would have been completely underwater. In car, second and follow-up raids by USN forces usually followed uh, from local air severity they had obtained. Yes. In car, Italians continue to build new battleships, Iroma and Opera. Yes. Because battleships make sense in the Mediterranean. They really do. You know, it, it, these ships were caught in harbour. If they had been caught and captured at sea, you know, you have Victoria Veneto get damaged later on by a swordfish again, I think. Um, Matapan, that sort of leads to them slowing down, which then leads to another attack, which hits a cruiser, which is how Matapan happens. But this is all 
this is the this is what they are doing in the extent of they are getting it done. The Royal Navy is getting these attacks done. And now my thing is to sort of I'm going to disappear for a second because I've drunk some a lot of, a lot of iron brew, and I'm going to be back, and then I'm going to be reading some one on one some personal accounts of the actual operation because we're just this lot going behind me. Because that's quite cool. Yeah, nope. Right. Mm. So, let's see. This is, again, the account from with Naval Wings. And I'm going to leave Comte de Cavour up, up, up there because um, it's rather appropriate. In car, from damage inflicted, would Latoria have been a total loss out at sea? Yes. I have a picture of Latoria uh, of um, Latorio at Matapan. Alright, um That that all right. Print screen. Take care, Channing.
Ren. Uh, Brecken Kendall. Um, uh, Impreur was the, pretty much the band in 1941. Dokio Cavassi was on the leader for escort ships. Cava was under repair until January 1943, according to Brea. I know Brea does write that, and I have seen the account, but um, but I doubt it in that I think he's going on the official documents, whereas I'm going on the accounts of the people who are actually involved in sort of the work. And they're all saying they're actually not doing anything. It's more a case of they are talking about it, not actually doing it because. Uh, it, it, it's good to have on paper because on paper it gives them an extra battleship on paper as something that sort of the fleet has but it doesn't actually mean it exists there you go, there's Latorio's damage honestly I would not like to have been in Latorio if I'd been at sea um Vittorio, Vin Vittorio Vinito was only hit by one torpedo I'm sorry, Brecken Kendall, but that doesn't mean that they wouldn't have been sunk at sea. Littorio's hit by three torpedoes. If she'd been hit by three torpedoes at sea, one of the advantages she has is the third torpedo, as you can see, which goes in at the stern, because uh, she's resting on the bed, doesn't start to get water, is actually raised above the water sort of level, because the bow is stuck in the stir uh, stuck in the seabed, so she doesn't go down. Whereas you have those free hits at sea, you go down. It's the same with the Conte de Cavour. If she'd been at sea, she'd have sunk. If she'd been at... Well, admittedly, though, at sea, it'd been far more difficult to get all those hits because getting all those hits at sea is you've got, you're dealing with a moving target. But if you're dealing with an even slightly deeper harbour than Taranto, you also have the trouble. Nick Helders, being unfair to the RN for not seeing this kind of attack is realistic. Or RN Scarpa on small scale, or yes, and Pearl Harbor. First attack type normally results in much better counters afterwards. Again, it's not really the first attack of type, and as I said, it's a case of they all believe they can because their own practice with their torpedoes, they think there's a depth at which the torpedoes won't work at. And they think the Taranto is in that depth. And as I've said repeatedly, the British can do it, the others can't, because the British have done, have got the tension wires and various other, and the wooden fins on their torpedoes, all sorts of things to make sure they do a belly flop, or as close to a belly flop as they can, rather than a dive into the water. Phantom, how important are Taranto in the memory of the fleet arm? Is it something very, very important like Trafalgar Jutland, or is it nothing particular? Uh, Taranto night is the biggest night of the year for the fleet air arm, and there's dinners every year for all the squad uh, for all the squadrons involved, and for the fleet air arm as a whole. It's something which is very, very important to the Royal Navy. Anna Filton, were the ships fully crewed? Yes, they were at full war uh, war, uh, war manning, and as I said, they had fifty percent of their AA manned at all times, and they had their crew there. Bring down true, but they didn't have full crews. Crews at action stations or full power available for damage control. They were fully crewed. They were already. They were planning for operations. They were all aboard, ready to go to sea at short notice. And as I said, they were manned at fifty percent. So, yeah, I'm sorry, Brecken. There are these ships would have gone if they if it had happened at sea. They've gone down. There is. I am as supportive as the Italian Navy being treated properly as you can be. I am the one who keeps going. They did have a defense. They did have all these things. They were doing the best they could. But 
still, the damage done to them is pretty horrific. And even if they'd had been at sea, if they'd received the same damage at sea, they'd have sunk. The reason they don't sink is because they rest on that bottom, that sh very nice shallow seabed. Lean car. One Latorio torpedo hit looks dangerously close to her A turret magazine. It was very, very close to the magazine. Very, very close. And also, again, please notice that there are two on starboard, and the it's port stern and forward starboard. Again, because of the way they're positioned in the harbour, they can be attacked from both sides. We had thought so that all these ships scattered over the Mediterranean would have given the Arager and Aeronautica a series of field days. However, we had suffered very little from enemy activity. At lunchtime on the 8th, a reconnaissance aircraft had spotted us and been driven off by our fighters, but obviously had reported us, because in the afternoon another appeared and was again driven off. Within the hour, seven SM-79s materialized. These were attacked by three Formars, which shot down two of them and made the others jettison their bombs and leave the scene hurriedly. Yesterday, the 10th, when we were west of Malta to meet Barham, we were again shadowed and the full mile shot down a Kant 7501. This was followed uh, about an hour later by the arrival of 10 SM-79s. They were flying at about 14,000 feet and were again attacked by our full miles and dropped their bombs at random, doing no damage. Their submarines had not had any great success. Warspite had heard two underwater explosions, which had been torpedoes self-destructing, and Ramleys, covering convoy MB3, heard three such explosions. No ship was hit, although Italian radio claimed a successful attack. Where has that happened before? Um... Dirt squad, uh, yeah. Uh, old Christian, uh, Kendall, uh, Richard, the fundamental failure at Pearl Harbor was insufficient standing long range air patrol. Uh, IGN should not, uh, should have been spotted well outside the strike range if long range recce had been up to snuff. I would agree they didn't need more Catalinas on patrol. I would also add, this is the thing, if they had been at open sea and it had been a night a torpedo attack and the Royal Navy had successfully carried it out, you also remember they would have had far less warning because they had very special listening posts ashore to listen out for enemy aircraft coming in. At sea, they don't have radar. They don't have those. So whilst, yes, they would have had more, they'd have had more room for maneuver and these things. There is also the chance they might not have even seen the torpedo bombers coming until they hit. So the first wave might have got in and managed to attack. They probably would have come on once they heard the aircraft engines, but again, at sea, you have the ship making a lot more noise. Got to the tenth, haven't I? I joined most of the pilots in the hangar to see our aircraft being armed for our jaunt that night. The bombers and the flare, uh, flare droppers were being loaded with two hundred fifty uh, fifty pound semi armor piercing bombs. I did say armor piercing earlier; they were semi armor piercing. Ah, well, frankly, that. But... How thin were those destroyers if semi armor piercing go through? That's the trouble. I was looking at the destroyer designs before I came on this one. These aircraft carried a different type of long-range tank from those carrying torpedoes. This tank was cigar-shaped and strapped to the torpedo rack. 
and didn't leak all over the um, observer. Our aircraft were to carry a new type of torpedo, which we had not used before. It carried a duplex contact mag magnetic pistol designed to pass under the battleship and explode below its soft underbelly. It would also explode on contact with the target. We had agreed that these would be set to run at 27 knots and at a de depth of 33 feet. A device consisting of a cable unwinding from a spool had been designed to avoid weapon porpoising, or diving too deeply, and sticking on the bottom of the harbour. They had been set to a low safety range of only 300 yards. We hoped that they would work better than the Italian ones. Our torpedo men lavished didn't care on them, and we had never suffered a failure in the past. There was little else to do but have some food and wait. Most of us filled in the time by walking around the quarterdeck to watch the other ships, always a sight worth viewing. As dusk was falling and presaging the fleet of friendly anonymity of darkness, we broke away from the main fleet and accompanied by the third cruiser squadron of Gloucester, Berwick, Glasgow and York and four destroyers, we turned at high speed to the north to take up our flying off position 40 miles west of uh, Cephalonia. At this point, Force X also carries on and goes up into the north into the Adriatic and has fun with a convoy. And actually destroys a convoy. It's quite you know, does a lot of damage to the convoy. So Force X is also one around. Force X is made up of a couple of cruisers and a couple of tribal class destroyers going, Hello! Nick Waters, Taranto gets compared to Pearl, but what would be a good example before Taranto? Hmm. Honestly, no one's really done a full-on attack. Merz El Kabir isn't really a proper a full-on attack. But they do quite well. They they sort of there are some monsters plan, but no. Um, battle of Senap? Not really. No. There's lots of things when they're sort of trying to, but in terms of an aerial attack, it's rare. Uh, you're basically looking, if you're looking at the practice, you're going back to Copenhagen as a sort of real example, and Armada and the Dutch cutting out of the Medway and these sort of things, but those are all with different technology types. This is an aerial attack. This is a bombardment in many ways. Port Arthur, I suppose, but again, no. Carl Gasper, Force X, about how north into the Adriatic? Enough to really, really wind up the um, Italians. Again, the idea Cunningham has is that if he goes into the Adriatic after launching to attack on Taranto, a damaged Italian navy will come charging out to attack the force which has gone into the Adriatic and will run into Force A, which is a whole load of battleship, which is every battleship he has available. And let's be, can, let's think about it. If the Italian Navy comes out with six battleships, that's gr uh, that's problematic for them uh, for the Royal Navy to take on. But if Taranto had taken out one or two battleships and they'd ended up fighting a night, that'd be great. Take out three, and the Italian Navy comes out to fight at night. Then the Royal Navy's at on parity with them, and the Royal Navy will happily take out the remainder of their battleships. Sondern Raid of 1918, potentially. Potentially. Zero hour was fast approaching. By 1930 hours, the first strike was being ranged at the after end of flight tech. By 2015 hours, all was ready, and 12 pilots manned their aircraft, followed by their observers armed with chart boards and their other paraphernalia. Most of the sort of second strike took up vantage points to watch the performance. We soon heard the familiar whine of inertia starters being wound up, the spit and cough as the engines fired, then the increasing roar as the pilots warned them, then ran them to full throttle. Illustrious began to gather speed as she increased to 30 knots to gather, give the maximum possible wind speed over the deck, to lift the heavily laden aircraft into the air. The natural wind was light and variable and gave little help. At 20-30 hours, the first swordfish went roaring down the deck and lifted easily before it reached the bows. The other nine all follow, uh, followed without incident and disappeared towards the northwest. It was all very routine and unexciting. 
As the last aircraft left the deck, the ship rapidly lost speed to give reasonable conditions to the handlers who were ready to range our strike. It isn't easy to push the swordfish around with 30 knots of wind howling over the deck. In three quarters of an hour, it would be our turn, so we went below to, to collect our flying gear and personal items to take with us, such as lucky teddy bears. I did not have anything of that sort, but put my faith in Joey. At 21.15 hours, we were told to man our aircraft. I climbed onto the flight deck to find E5H. My faithful E5B was languishing at the keeler. I climbed in, settling myself on the parachute. My fitter and rigger strapped me in, giving me a pat on the helmet and said, Good luck, sir. See you in the morning. I hoped that they would. Pat Humphrey struggled into his crack cockpit behind me. In a few minutes, the EDO's like illuminated wand started to circle with the signal to start up our engines. The crew wound the inertia starter. As the revs were building, I set the throttle, then knocked on to the, uh, the magne two magneto switches as the clutch was engaged. With a cough, splutter, and cloud of exhaust, the engine fired, and I caught it on the throttle, setting it for a warm-up. I checked the engine instruments, which all read that they, what they should, then ran the engine to full throttle, switched off and on each magneto switch. The old Pegasus was running perfectly, so I reduced a tick over and waited. Chris Southgate, hello for starters. And earlier, Billy Mitchell, uh, an unmanned air, an unmanned ship, and he's breaking all the rules of the exercise. Yeah, it shows it's theoretically possible, but it makes such conditions. Uh, how do I put it? It has an impact on it. It, it validates quite a lot of the responses because he doesn't follow the rules, and it because it's realised it's not a full blown up warship, so it allows people to ignore it. That's the trouble. When you break the rules, you have to make sure the rules of exercise are set realistically, but you also have to make sure you're not, you don't break them to try and win the, uh, win the thing, because then that invalidates it. Uh, I do agree with Colin's dad. The main problem for the Italians was quality control. If they'd had a good batch of shells with their rangers at day, they would have had very good options. At night, it's their, their range finders aren't as useful. And the British would probably have got very, very close. And down to three battleships. Stefan Panang, HMS Vindictive's attack on Kronstadt as a precursor to Toronto. Uh, not really. Yes and no. I could feel the ship building up speed and turning slightly into the fruitful wind. I heard the leader's aircraft open up and roar down the deck. The aircraft handlers were doing their usual hair-raising act of ducking under around the whirling propellers to pull shocks away. When my turn came, I followed the EDO signals to taxi onto the center line of the deck, held on the brakes while the wings were spread and locked. Then opening, uh, opening the throttle fully and easing in the boost override, I let the brakes go and started my takeoff run. With the ship's speed at 30 knots, airspeed rode us rapidly. As we passed the island, a quick glance at the ASI showed it rising to 70 knots. We rose smoothly into the air and I climbed away in a gentle turn to port and reduced the revs the normal climbing, to normal climbing power. I looked above for the other aircraft and Pat and I saw them at the same time. I slid into my slot in the formation as we continued to circle the ship. I asked Pat if he knew the reason for delay. He said that he could only count seven of us, then corrected this to eight. As we passed again through the north, the leader, the north, the leader, Lieutenant Commander Hale straightened up and set course northwest. Later, we found that L5F and L5Q had started to taxi at the same time and had collided. The latter had not been damaged and taken off to join us, but L5F, with Lieutenants Clingford and Goring, had suffered broken ribs and torn fabric and had to be struck down for repair. Herculean efforts by the riggers had made it serviceable in a quarter of an hour. And the crew, who had begged permission to be allowed to go on their own, took off after only 24 minutes after us. Please note that. L5F, with Lieutenants Clifford and Goring, had suffered broken ribs. The aircraft had had broken ribs and torn fabric and had to be struck down for repair. But she was repaired and airborne again within a quarter of an hour. So 24 minutes after they'd been damaged, the crew took off to take the strike on and, if necessary, go in solo. 
That's the advantage of the swordfish. Very, very serviceable. Castle now, goes on. Gannick Sun Clark, considering World War I, even the tiny mass boats had hydrophones to hunt for coastal convoys. Weren't Italians using hydrophones on ships as a night early warning? Not. You'd think they would be, but um, didn't really work that well, and it definitely didn't work at detecting aircraft. And as you saw in, as the experience of Matapan shows, it they didn't detect the battleships coming. Insider, hadn't Lumley Listener planned something like this when serving Gloria sometime before? Yes, he'd started off planning in the Abyssinia crisis. He'd done uh, the first, last, massively worked up. The Royal Navy kept a permanent plan of how to sink people in harbours. They'd pretty much been working on that since they'd started off with the plans of Wilhelmshaven. Uh, I'm fairly sure they had a few for the US Navy as well going around somewhere. But um, the ones for the Taranto had been really, really updated in 1935, and basically from 1935 onwards were updated pretty much on a yearly basis to make sure they took account of what had been developed there. So they always had a plan not far behind. We gradually climbed to 8,000 feet, passing through a layer of flimsy cl of filmy cloud. Pat told me we now seem to be another aircraft short. We do not know at the time, but L5Q had lost her long-range tank, which, as she was one of the bombers, had been strapped to her torpedo rack. The engine had cut, and but her pilot, Lieutenant Morford, had managed to restart it. He now had insufficient fuel to fly to Taranto, and back so had returned to Illustrious, where, not expecting a friendly aircraft, they had opened fire on him, stopping luckily before he was hit. So now we are only seven. It was a beautiful picture postcard evening. There were only a few wisps of cloud below us, Elfwise, the sky was clear and littered with a blaze of stars. To the south, a three-quarter moon was throwing, uh, throwing a golden pathway across the calm sea. The air was smooth, giving hardly a judder. It would have been the most perfect evening to enjoy flying, had it not been for the reason of our flight. It had become quite cold, but that could be expected in an open cockpit at 8,000 feet. I asked Pat if he was comfortable and he replied, as far as might be expected. I didn't envy him. Jammed into the aftermost cockpit with vapour from the tank wafting around him while I was in a reasonable comfortable sitting and on my parachute uh, cushion with an acceptable amount of space and surrounded by the familiar instruments. Once again, I found myself with little to do. My old trick of putting my mind into cold storage didn't work this time. It seemed like riding through Egypt on a camel while pretending that the pyramids didn't exist. After flying for more than an hour, I noticed that the dark blue fabric of the horizon ahead was torn by a patch of light. I pointed out to Pat who looked through his binoculars and said that it must be Taranto. But neither of us knew why it appeared to be floodlit. As we closed the land, the light seemed to flicker and pulse still, until when we clo were closer still, it began to look like a major fireworks play. Within some horror, I realised that it what it was. AA fire. What were they shooting at? The first strike should have been, uh, well, uh, clear and out long ago. The zoom loom of the land began to clarify, and our two remaining flare droppers broke away to our, fo uh, to our right heading for their zone over the oil storage depot. There was a healthy fire burning over there, so someone in the first strike must have achieved a hit. It's fun. Hmm. <laughs> Bad home, and have some air crews that really should have been able to get in the air with those anchors between legs. Mm. I'm presuming that's a continuation on something else he wrote, Bad home. Come closer. The Iron kept planning, uh, kept planning sinking ships in harbour. They probably planned sinking anything. Yeah. The RN's idea is if they can sink you in harbour before you get to sea, then there's no chance of you doing any economic damage to Britain. It's a very simple modus operandi, but it does work. Hmm. Dead lady. Let's see. Hmm. Two hours forty-five. 
I love the way uh, they liked the, the um the lovely people at YouTube like to try and predict how long your lives are going to be. And they always give you a rough figure of how long they think it's going to be. And they always predict mine for roughly three and a half hours. They know me too well. We'll get that. Uh, we'll do that. Look at that in a bit. I'll move that down. And say that. Hmm. Osprey28, no, I missed most of the stream. No, you haven't. There's probably at least another half hour, 40 minutes of it. Again, I took the puppy dog for a walk before my last lecture of the day, so it um, gives me more time to talk to you all and answer your questions on Taranto. In car, strange the RN never went back to disrupt salvage plans, similar to the RN not get, going back to the dams. And I, uh, well, it's not really, because the Royal Navy then has Greece and Crete and all sorts of other things to deal with. So it's a case of Taranto's great, and you'd love to go back to, but then there's other operations going on, there's other commitments. Take care, old Richard. We were still some 10 miles from the harbour, but at a height of 8,000 feet, it was becoming clearly delineated in the bright moonlight and the glare from the tracer. Although partly obscured by smoke and gunfire, it was a copy of the excellent photos given us by the Marylands. Hail altered course slightly to port, and we could see to our right the breakwater, Diego de San Vito, and dead ahead, the little Isoleta San Paolo, with the large island San Pietro just left of it. We began to open out, open out the formation and slide into a well-spaced line astern. Our plan was to pass around and to seaward, uh, seaward of the submerged breakwater, then to turn towards the east after passing Cape Rondinella, across the land, then dive down behind the balloon barrage, turning south as we came over the harbour so that the battleships would be broadside onto us and actually overlap so that if we missed our chosen targets, there would be a chance of hitting next in line. It was a good plan on paper. The northern shore of the basin was lit by flashes from gun batteries there, and now falling behind us, the island of San Pietro was spurting flames. I could imagine Pat at the moment. He'd be stowing his chart, board, and navigation gear in somewhat rel some relatively spa safe space, checking that his G-string was firmly secured, and that his parachute pack was easily accessible, although there would not be much chance to use it during a torpedo attack. His usual calm voice came down the Gosport tubes, the course for Illustrious, incidentally, should be 135 degrees. You might like to set it now. He was being very thoughtful. If he was uh, were to be knocked out while I was still in one piece, I might be able to find my way home with that information. We passed Cape Rondinella, starting to lose height and turn in over the land. The harbour was partly obscured by smoke from the guns and the burning oil depot, and also from another blaze north, the seaplane base or a crash swordfish. The ground was clear below in the moonlight. I could see streets of houses like a town plan with open spaces of parks and playing fields. I hoped that the residents were all in air raid shutters as spent bullets and shrapnel must be raining down like lethal hailstones. I followed the leader and as he gradually lost height. Suddenly there was a burst of light to the eastward as the first flare ignited, followed by others until they hung in the sky like a necklace of sparkling diamonds. This seemed to drive the Italians to even greater fury. The flak doubled in intensity and the curtain of barrage below us now rose into a cone like a feathered headdress. Above us, high-angled AA was bursting in crackling puffs of smoke. If the tracer was one in five, there must be more metal than the air. My God, no one can fly through that. Shades of balaclava. In the increasing chaos, I lost sight of the other aircraft. No matter, a coordinated torpedo attack was not so important, as the targets were stationary. We must simply get amidst the battleships and do our own thing. Ahead there seemed to be a partial hold in the flak, just where I wanted to be. I aimed for it, calling to Pat, hang on, I'm going down. Okay, do your worst. Good luck. 
came the reply. I pushed, uh, pushed the nose down, easing back the throttle to avoid over-revving the engine. The speed built up 140 knots, 150 knots, 155 knots. I wanted to dive as steeply as possible, knowing that a gentle angle would only give me more time in the barrage. We were in it. The familiar red, green, and yellow lines of Tracer were crawling up towards us, then hurtling past. Ahead, they appeared as a tangle of colour. The slipstream was, uh, slipstream was screaming through the struts and bracing wires past my ears. My nose was filled with the stretch of censured cordite. There was Tracer above us, Tracer below us, and Tracer seemingly passing between the wings. The dive was steepening and the build speed building up. 160 knots, 170 knots. We met a barrage balloon. No self-respecting balloon should be, have been at that height. Its cable must have been shot away. I hold the stick over the left. I missed it. There was a tremendous jar. The whole aircraft shuddered, and a stick flew out of my hand. Christ! I've hit the balloon cable, but the wings were still there. I grabbed the stick. It wouldn't move. We were completely out of control. It was no time for finesse. I applied brute force and ignorance. It must move most of its travel to the right, but only partially to the left. Was it working the airlines? I had no idea. I looked ahead. Bloody hill! We were all diving almost vertically into the centre of the city of Toronto. I hauled the stick back into my stomach. Were the elevators working? They were. An elephant seemed to be sitting in my lap, but slowly we began to level out, but still curving round to the right. Where were we going to make it? Buildings, cranes, factories and chimneys were streaking past below us. Then we shot out over the eastern shore of the harbour and were level over a black mirror speckled with their reflection of flames and bursting shells. I stirred the stick around and found that I had at least some sloppy lateral control. Airspeed, far too fast to ditch if we had to, and too fast to, dro to, uh, to drop a torpedo. I was determined to aim it at something after carrying the, f the thing all that way, and having a rather hairy dive, I'd be damned if I didn't do something with it. Stephen Malaski, hello. What's the book? With Naval Wings by John Wellham. One of the 824 pilots involved in Toronto. Seem lacking. Came late. What's the book? The story seem always seems incre so incredible to me and likely to be successful as the Channel Dash to me. Well, that's the interesting thing. The, you know, Channel Dash, they have fighter opposition and it's daytime. Toronto, no fighters. It's nighttime. The ships aren't moving. There's so much more of ships, but they aren't moving. And in a way, the Royal Navy knows where it's going and over it's coming up. Ian Carr, would Formidable have joined Illustrious in the Eastern Med if not for damage, or were there other plans? I have a feeling if not for damage, Formidable might have made it out to the Eastern Med. But there's also the option that Formidable could have freed up another carrier or herself been sent out to the Far East or the Indian Ocean. I wouldn't be surprised if you'd had Formidable, though, actually. I wouldn't. Being surprised if you'd ended up with another force, or maps even it being called Force K or something, um, based in probably the Indian Ocean side of the Suez Canal, um, with the option that it could come into the Eastern Med if the Mediterranean fleet needed reinforcing, but could also operate in the in the Indian Ocean, if needed, to deal uh, to deter the Japanese. That's where I have a feeling Formidable would have ended up if it hadn't been for Illustrious being damaged. I have a doubt. You know, it would have been interesting if you have Illustrious and Formidable both in service, uh, and neither of them gets damaged. Then you do have a very interesting scenario when you have Force Z being formed up. Because do you how many do you take aircraft carriers out to her, out to them, and? The odds are you at least get one aircraft carrier, if not two. And if they've got Sea Hurricanes aboard, or full Mar even full Mars, but considering that the attack on uh, Prince of Wales and Repulse doesn't have fighter escorts, even full Mars breaking up the attack would have been useful. And of course, with the aerial contr air control you'd have of a carrier with you, you'd probably also have had the cruisers operating alongside Force C, so you'd have had a far bigger AA armament, but you'd also have had probably the land-based fighters would have been far better coordinated and far better linked into the system, so they'd have been called up. So the full miles would have been doing the initial dealing with, and they'd have been calling up land-based air to come and assist them, and 4C could have been very different under those circumstances. 
the Mediterranean is a fairly critical conflict for what happens in World War Two. Osprey twenty eight, a whole one hundred sixty knots, whole impressive for a sawfish. Um, yeah, I, 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 I think at the point there he gets up to one hundred seventy knots. That's very impressive for a sawfish. Anyway, came late. Uh, Come on, apply brute force. If I remember the book Swordfish correctly, the string bang required rough stick and pedal handling to begin with. That's why crew hated Barracuda and even hydraulics. Eh, the Swordfish didn't require as much as the Barracuda. Death Squad, Carmel Gasworth, probably controls a bit more stiff than some. But most planes at the time were controlled by pulley and wire instead of hydraulics. Hmm. A quick glance around to my right and slightly behind me was a massive black object covering most of the horizon and having a vast castle towering above it. A battleship! I heaved a stick over to the right, putting us into a near vertical turn towards the target. I thought, that was a damn stupid thing to do. She might not go back. Ah, she did. I leveled out after turning 180 degrees and pointing towards the great black hulk of the ship. Height okay, judging from the level of deck. Airspeed dropping nicely. Angle of attack not ideal, but the best that I could do. Aircraft altitude for dropping a torpedo, rotten. The only way that I could achieve a straight line was skidding with some left rudder and the right wing slightly down. Torpedoes don't like being dropped when not perfectly level. There was surprising little flack around us. I was forced to revise this opinion. She was awake and had seen us. String, but strings of light prickled along her decks, and was multiple bridges and and multiple bridges and grew into long coloured pencil lines drawn across the dark sky above us. She was giving us everything except her fifteen-inch guns, but thankfully she seemed unable to depress her other guns low enough to hit us. Closer and closer we came. Her decks ablaze with muscle flashes. The superstructure towering above us. Look out! Don't get too close. Those things have a safety range. I heard. I thought. I don't know. I pressed the button on my throttle lever, felt the torpedo release, held straight for a couple of seconds, then threw the stick over into the vertical turn to starboard. I think it's more he fought it than he heard it. Inevitably, after dropping the nearly 2,000 pound load, an aircraft rises, an E5H was no exception. We rose right into the ship's gunfire. I fought the sloppy controls to force her down, crying, fly you, B-I-T-C-H. Poor thing, she was doing her best. There was another jar and shudder. We'd been hit again. H.E.L.'s teeth. Leave me something to take home. Finally, I managed to push her down to the skim the glassy surface, open the throttle wide, and knocked into her override. Careful, don't hit the water, I thought. It's difficult to judge height over a smooth surface, particularly at night. Ahead was Diego de Tentarola, with its balloons. I must avoid that if I could, but mustn't get too far to the right, as there were more balloons over there. I edged over to pass slightly to the right of the eager, which I hoped would take me clear of the balloons on either side. I could see San Pietro about three miles ahead. Its batteries and those of the floating platoons across the harbour entrance were still firing, but were aiming towards the centre of the basin. Tracer from the battleships was passing over from the stern of us and disappearing ahead. Tracer, scraping the surface of the, uh, the sea, we shot past the island into the wonderful welcoming anonymity of the darkness. We were clear in the clear air and still flying, although hardly in the approved flying school manner. Would she keep on flying long enough to get home? I eased the nose gently upwards, took out the boost override, and adjusted the throttle to give me normal climbing revs and boost. She started to climb. I moved the stick gently in all directions and applied a little rudder in both directions. Everything seemed to be working, at least to some extent. But I could only keep a straight course with the starboard wing a few degrees down and by applying some left rudder. She was behaving much the same as she had when I was trying to attack the ship. No well-behaved swordfish fly like that, but if she was prepared to fly at all, I would not criticise too much. I swept my eyes over the dashboard. The engine instruments were showing no problems. Rev steady, boost okay. Oil pressure correct, oil temperature a little high, but that was reasonable with the way I had been treating the poor engine. Flight instruments were all over the place, showing wing down, skidding, and a general lack of keenness for the aircraft altitude. This at least showed that they were working. It felt as though we'd been over Toronto for hours, but in fact it could not have been more than a few minutes. 
Since Pat was always the perfect observer who never interrupted when I was involved with things that needed my full attention, I had not worried about his silence, but I now felt a bit concerned, as I hadn't heard a word since we'd left the coast. I lifted the Gosport tune and called rather tentatively, Are you all right, Pat? There was a sound, like the heavy breathing at the beginning of an obscene telephone call, then, Yes, physically. What is your condition? I assured him that I was still seemed, seemed to be functioning normally, and I, he said, Oh, that's good. I thought that you might be damaged, as you had bent the aeroplane a bit. It wasn't my fault. It was the bloody eye ties. He assured me that he had not intended to imply any criticism of my flying, which he felt must have been fairly competent, as I had got in and out and we were still flying. And he had some doubts about that happening when we entered the barrage. I explained what had happened during the dive and the attack. This caused silence for a few minutes. He had not appreciated that we had been completely out of control and nearly in a nasty mess in the centre of Trento. Nor that I had only partial control during the attack. He had not noticed either that we were not able to fly straight, even now. Eventually he said, I see. I suppose we should consider ourselves fortunate. Do you think that you can get what's left of the machine back to Illustrious? I replied that there was a fair chance. I was going to try, as I did not fancy eating spaghetti for the rest of the war. He quite agreed and said he left it entirely to me. I suggested it would be more likely to find the fleet if he could give me a course to steer. And this reply was that I would have to wait a few minutes as all his navigation gear was somewhat in the bottom of the cockpit. Meanwhile, I should steer roughly southeast. I was already putting more or less that direction, so left him to do some hunting around the floor. It's a good book. Ian Sadler, peg leg lamb wrecking a string bag could reach 200 knots in a dive. Uh, from a high enough altitude, yes. Osprey 28, I'm ordering the cassette version and I'll digitize it. Cool. Steve Michael, seems like an re awesome read, I want it. Uh, you will find a link to the Amazon version, Amazon copies for sale in my um, Amazon store link down below, but you can find it a fair nice place. It's, it's a very, very good book. Nick Water seems confident about his identification of different ships. Will they have had recon focus or recon ship positions? Practice of ship outline recognition? Yes, and yes. They had recon photos which were literally from the morning for the attack. And um, a guy called Charles Lamb is the one who has to go out and collect it. Now, if I remember correctly... He's flying E5H. And if I go to the Swordfish book by Rag... Um, E5H, you can't see it on an insistent rag uh, book, but I will go in. But literally, it's the one up the top here, and you can see from the flight it does this, and it's one of the ones which hits the Comte de Cavour. So the battleship he hits is the Comte de Cavour. And I will zoom that in. And you can see his route. He is uh, the closest aircraft to this side. And you can even see the little circle, he uh, the little spin he does to do his attack pattern. So if you've got aircraft doing that, that's a bit of a problem for them to try and deal with. Ian Carr, E5H means an Eagle aircraft. Yes. He was from 824 Squadron, which was transferred across from Eagle. Another reason to like this book is because of the picture of HMS Illustrious in it. And some stats. This is again courtesy of Jamie, who did this brilliant research, and then I went on, kept, checked it up, and found it to be correct. So instead of me claiming it's my own research, it's Jamie did this research from Armored Carriers, and I've then just checked it and gone, that's great. I'm not going to repeat what something's already done. Great one. 
Um, illustrious sorties 21 aircraft against Toronto, of which 20 managed to, re managed to reach there and two are shot down. Admiral Nagomo launches 355 against Hawaii. Royal Navy flew at night. It, uh, Imperial Navy waited for dawn. Um, Nagumo launches his strike against unprepared, surprised defenders. Cunningham's air crew went up against an actively defended and fully alert facility for what is a wartime formation. The aircraft was repairable when he got back. E5H does carry on in the war. Uh, the Italians lost one battleship and two severely damaged. As I said, one they talk about repairing, they never actually are repairing it. A destroyer and a heavy cruiser are lightly damaged. The destroyer has a torpedo go... Uh, one of the bombs goes the whole way through it, which is why I presume they were armor piercing not the semi arm piercing which was sensible for going after those things, but still, yeesh. How thin's your destroyer? Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor destroys three and severely damages four battleships and three destroyers. Also caught many aircraft. As I said, the Royal Navy takes out the seaplane base. Cost of the Royal Navy, and Royal Navy was two aircraft out of 20 which are reached there, and 21 in total is deployed, which is, let's say, 10%. The Japan loses 29 aircraft out of 355. So they actually do better on that one. They're doing less than 10%. Royal Navy is slightly under 10% as well. But, you know. Um, the Royal Navy suffers no casualties in the related actions. Force X and all these things go through unscathed. Six Japanese uh, submarines were sunk. Ian Sadler, are you sure about Lamb? With naval wings was the story I was giving, which is um, J John Wellham. He was on Eagle. Uh, Lamb is serving an illustrious, and that's War in a String Bag. That's the book I've got over there. I was reading from Lamb's account, though, uh, from Wellam's account, though, because Lamb is one of the people who is doing the oversight and is flying a bomb slash flare aircraft, whereas Wellam is one of the ones who's flying into it. Okay, Ian Sadler. Ian Carr, how many torpedoes were taken to Toronto? I think it's 12. I have a list. Again, courtesy of Jane, in these excellent notes. So I am shamelessly using them, but I'm shamelessly promoting them. Uh, let's see. First wave is 12 aircraft, 6 carrying torpedoes, 2 carrying 250 pound bombs and flares, and 4 carrying 6 250 pound bombs. And second wave consists of 9 aircraft, 5 torpedo carriers, and 2 carrying torpedoes. So it's 11. 11, torpe uh, 11 torpedoes are taken. Uh, E5H is technically gets repaired after the thing, but it was hit by an exploding shell in the wing in the wing and managed to stay aloft. And in fact, it returns home with pretty much one at the bottom of one wing missing. So the bottom right wing, if I remember correctly, is missing. The bottom star, the bottom starboard wing is actually pretty much missing. Managed to return on three wings out of four. Third squad, was it Toronto that the spotter returned thinking that he was only survivor to be greeted by everyone else from his squadron upon landing on the aircraft? It wasn't the spotter, it was Charles Lamb, who was, as I said, was flying one of the bomber a bomb slash flare aircraft. Um, and he was one of the illustrious pilots in the first wave, and he thought he would be He thought he was the only survivor. 
because he saw all his friends go into the flak. And because the thing is, the swordfish have found that the safe space was underneath the flak level. So from all he could see was he his friends disappearing into the flak and the smoke and all the explosions. And he didn't see them coming out from his position. So he thought they all died. And he thought they all died for nothing as well, because he thought they uh, they hadn't managed to um, get it. And he talk, uh, get an hit anything. Poor man. You feel sorry for someone actually thinking that, because that must have been devastating for him until he got back to the ship and found them all arraigned there and waiting for him. Um, there's a quote from him in here. Um, in car. Presumably, the had to be eliminated to land the aircraft back on. Actually, what they did was they did quite a clever system. So they dropped off these boys, which had basically candles in them that would burn out behind the stern to create. They had a beacon which was set to the same minutes as, as, as your watch. So when you heard it, you knew that on which point, as it was flashing around every 60 seconds, if you heard it, the direction of your second hand was where you needed to go. Your Basically, you could get a point, you have your watch and go, whichever way the, the, the thing was pointing, that was where it was. Then once you got close enough, you'd see these boys. And they were also lit up. It was specially covered uh, lights, so they could only be seen from above and behind. If you were in front of the carrier, you couldn't see it. If you were to the side of the carrier, you couldn't see it. If you were at any point other than above and behind the carrier, you couldn't see the lights. But when you were above and behind, you could see the lights. And they had people with lit wands flashing them around to basically guide you in. So it's a very, very intense process to get the aircraft down and in. Dirt Squad, Trent McCartney, it's only half wing missing. What are you complaining about? Yeah, pretty much. Um, you know, as far as the swordfish is concerned, half a wing is nothing. Uh, actually, um, Jemak, any of this book described debriefing after the raid? Well, let's do the example. Let's do because you've asked about it. When we were flying for over an hour since our hurried departure from Toronto, I began to feel that we should now know something shortly. I was suffering from a very stiff and rather painful leg, but having from having to hold on to left rudder all the time. I asked Pat if he had any idea of our ETA. In an incredibly calm and confident voice, he said, Oh yes, about 25 minutes. I'm just going to tell you that I picked up the ship's beacon. My spirits rose about 200%. I asked for a change of course. He told me to carry on as I was. It took a few moments to accept this. We had been flying over sea at night for well over 100 miles. There had been nothing with which to check dead reckoning navigation other than perhaps a back bearing off Toronto in the early strangers stages, but he had brought us back to a moving fleet without a single alteration of course. I had always known that he was a good navigator, but this was phenomenal. It didn't hurt his feelings by suggesting that there might have been an element of luck. 
Fifteen minutes later, I saw the foaming phosphorescent swirl of a sort of destroyer's wake. As we passed over the screen, then directly ahead, the bulk of the illustrious loomed and became a familiar, sh a familiar shape in the bright moonlight. I switched on navigation lights, and then, behind my left ear, came the flicker of Pat's oldest lamp as he gave the recognition signal. A pinpoint of light from the ship's island acknowledged. I eased the throttle slightly back to lose height. Then, as we passed over a flight deck, banked as far as possible into a left-hand turn to make a very wide circuit. Poor old E5H refused to turn to the left any more steeply. I pulled the little lever that should release the arrestor hook and hoped that it had worked. But we were losing height at the desired rate and my gentle circuit seemed about right to bring me in line with the flight deck. As I turned over the final approach lines of lights delineating land area and the Dilico's illuminated bats became clear. Good. I eased back the speed to that approved for deck landing a swordfish. The damned thing was immediately out of control. I banged the throttle open and at once achieved the old skidding but controllable attitude. The LCO was giving me furious too fast signals. Hard luck. Fortunately, he was very experienced and good at his job. Realized that there must be some reason for wild progress and gave me a very clear cut signal as I slid up to the round down. We hurtled over the arrest of the first arrest of wires, missing them all. The left wing started to drop. Here we go, a terrific jerk. We had caught a wire while still airborne. A resounding thud as the wheels hit the deck. Then we stopped. I couldn't believe it. We are home, with both and us unhurt. I sat like an idiot, holding the brakes on. Then suddenly woke up to furious come-on signals from the FDO. Releasing the brakes, I taxied forward on the, onto the lift, where the handlers instantly folded the wings while I cut the initial switches. The faithful Pegasus gave a final splutter and cough that subsided into glorious silence. I said to Pat, Sorry about the landing. His reply was, I thought it was quite good in the circumstances. Praise indeed. The lift dropped to hangar level and we rapidly brushed into the hangar into the brilliant lights. I was absolutely astonished at the scene. The hangar was full of swordfish. Nearly everyone must have returned safely. I had expected that we would have been one of the few to survive. Pulling off the, my helmet, I heard cries from fitters and riggers. Fucking hell, mate. Look at him. Look at the ruddy wing. See them blading earrings. I followed their eyes. The rod connecting the ailerons on the port and upper lower wings was smashed with the jagged ends grinding together, resulting in one ailerone being slightly up and the other slightly down. Not surprising that I suffered a loss of lateral control. The port lower main plane had a hole about a yard long by half a yard wide. How on earth could any aircraft fly in that state? I did not think that anything but a swordfish could have done it. At that point, I would have happily subscribed towards a statue to the designer. I felt that I had to give Joey some credit, but couldn't help thinking, albeit somewhat unfairly, that if he had concentrated a bit harder, we might not have been hit at all. The lads climbed onto the stub plates. Are you okay, sir? How did you fly in the back in that state? Did the fish run all right? Did you hit anything? I told them that I was fine. It must have been their good maintenance that kept it flying. The torpedo dropped all right, but I had not had a clue about hits. I promised to tell them all about it when we found the true results. At briefing, we found that all aircraft are returned except two. Lieutenant Commander Williamson with Lieutenant Scarlet of 815 Squadron and Lieutenant Bailey and Slaughter of our own 824 from Eagle were missing. We were distressed about the losses, but amazed at the low percentage of them. We hoped that our colleagues might be prisoners of war. With the smack, flak, smoke and general chaos over Toronto, no one could be clear about what had been achieved. It looked as though there were, had been a t a torpedo hits on the battleships, the seaplane base and the oil depot. Everyone agreed had been burning merrily, and there had been confusion in Mar Piccolo. We would have to wait the Maryland's photographs to know the truth. There was one great disappointment. A high percentage of bombs had failed to explode. No particular reason for this was being get found. Later, it was found due to faulty manufacture. Especially furious were Clifford and Goring, who had made such efforts to get their aircraft repaired and then attacked on their own. Not one of their bombs had exploded. We dropped down a troop down to the wardroom to find that the catering staff had been doing their bit. Apart from drinks, they laid on masses of grub and even a huge cake in the shape of a swordfish. The room was full of air crew, all nattering at once, the pilots waving their arms and cries of, There I was, nothing on the clock, black hurling past my ears. It was not long, however, before the crowd began to thin. A veil of fatigue was falling over everyone. I staggered off to the cubby hole where I'd rigged my camp bed, stripped off and fell asleep into my sleeping bag. As soon as I closed my eyes, it seemed a film screen had been planted inside my lips. Lids, long and colorized pencil lines of tracers were flashing past me. Eventually, I must have dozed for a time, for I woke just before seven o'clock to feel the ship shaking like a leaf as she steamed at high speed to rejoin the main fleet. 
There seemed little chance of any more sleep, so I dressed and climbed to the quarter deck, where I found a number of others who were suffering from the same problem. It was a grey day. The Mediterranean sea and sun had crept behind a curtain of grey cloud. The sea was grey, and as far as the eye could see, there were grey ships. We were joining the fleet when suddenly the dismal, dismal scene was bright by a flashing splash of colour as a host of signal flags climbed up the main mast of the flagship. Someone who could understand these things about the, without the aid of book translated. I'm sure we all felt a surge of euphoria. It was one of the greatest compliments that a ship can be paid in the Royal Navy, with typical assignment to read, illustrious manoeuvre, well executed. Feeling no little pride, we went down to enjoy a huge breakfast. There was much more chatter than usual. It was an accepted procedure in the Navy to remain as silent at breakfast, possibly for the benefit of any hangovers, and one expects to hear only the rustle of newspaper or a sort of voice request for the salt. After the meal, we moved into the anteroom where we received a shock. It was planned that we should repeat our performance that night. There are a few gasps and general silence. An observer broke it and brought it back to me that I was thinking of Bal Balaclava as we entered Toronto. They only asked the Light Brigade to do it once. It appeared that in view of the success of our night's effort, a plan had been passed to the CNC that it should be repeated with 12 aircraft. Admiral Cunningham had queried in the fairness of expecting the pilots and observers to do it again so soon, but agreed to leave the decision to the rear admiral aircraft carriers. The tentative plan had been worked out that an attack could be made from the same position as the previous night. Usually, when an operation is projected, there is enthusiasm and a great deal of discussion, but this time it was sadly lacking. I went into the hangar as I had promised my crew that I would give them more details. They had already heard a buzz about another operation and were horrified. They aren't going to make you do it again, are they, sir? I told them that it might happen. Old E5H was looking very depressed, lying like a plucked turkey with her port ma main planes on the deck beside her. The ailerons removed and much of the fabric stripped. The ancient cowlings were often piled in a heap behind her. They told me that she would need many new ribs, new ailerons and control rods, and they re then recovering with fabric. The engine which had served me so well needed a complete check and run on deck as it, on my own admission I had grossly mistreated it, using the boost override for far longer than the maximum time approved in the book. They said there was no hope of her being ready to fly that night. I wondered if that would preclude me from being on the, cru on the cruise for the next operation, but thought not, as being one of the torpedo pilots I could easily be given another aircraft. Everything was still in the melting pot. Uh, Dirk Squad, how did the spotters see the aircraft to guide them in? They turned on their lights, their navigation lights, so they could see them. James Garrett, same idea, different war. How viable was the planned attack on the high seas fleet? Any torpedo nets in the harbour? No torpedo nets in the harbour. Oh, uh, who knows? Honestly, who knows? The fact is, if having done it, the idea was to stop the, 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 um, uh, stop the Germans feeling safe in harbour, and that's what they would have achieved. Nick Waters, lovely Brummy accent there. Uh, probably terrible, but I was trying to give it a, a give it reasonable. Nick Waters, dud bombs, USN subcapsules feel your pain. That's the thing. He, both sides are having quality control issues. Ian Sadler, what would the result of the suggested restrike have been? Well, with only three battleships left in harbour, the three damaged battleships, probably, well, if they'd been hit some more. Oof. Those battleships would probably have been put beyond recover. Or would have been seriously damaged. Hello, Melanie, 16 and 40. I seem to have missed a few bits. Uh, just a little bit. Next Sadler. It was pointed out that they moved all mobile ships out next day. So limited for high risk. Um, the remaining vessels. All the vessels that could float were out. Of the, out. But, again, it's a case of if you do go back... Yes, you have a lot more air defense, but, well, you have less air defense because all the ship guns have gone, um, but you still have the thing of they don't want to hit the dark harbor, so you might that still might protect you, but those ships which are the damaged ships could get to, well, let's be honest, I'm not sure there's much good, the more damage you could do to the Comte de Cavour, but the other two. Let's be honest, if 12 aircraft had gone in, probably armed as the first strike, six with torpedoes, and they concentrated on the two most likely to uh, two most likely to be repairable ships, 
Let's say they each get a couple of hits. Or there's three hits between them. That could well mean that there's two battleships, be uh, two more battleships beyond repair. Trent McCarthy, did Cunning keep his flag on Warspite the whole time he was in the mid? As long as he could keep it on Warspite, he did. Manny 640, didn't Germany have some problems with detonators and their pistols as well? They did. But this was problems not with the torpedoes. This was problems with the bombs, the 250 pounds uh, semi armor pissing bombs. And there's even more. There's actually, there is an American involved. As you'll hear more about. You'll hear more about in the videos that we've done as bilge pumps. About the Americans and the Japanese involved and the various things going on. Oh, it was fun looking. Um, Greg Salsky, was any consideration given to simultaneous struggle, uh, submarine strike while anyone was distracted by the aircraft? Not really, because they had enough defenses to keep the submarines out. I do wonder, and we do discuss this in our bilge pumps videos, which are going to be coming out at some point on Toronto uh, this week, and possibly one tomorrow and then over the next couple of weeks, um, why the Royal Navy didn't actually have some submarines deployed there to stop the ships coming out of harbour to attack them when they came out of harbour. But the thing is, again, you have a limited number of ships and they're doing other things. Merlin 1640. Oh, really? What were the problems in the bombs? I also thought they, also thought they had problems with their torpedoes. Something about UK carrier getting away with uh, after multiple duds. The Germans had problems with their torpedoes as well. Um, the British had problems with their bombs. The British had a... Uh, the the dead, Let's put it this way. The duplex torpedoes, they did have some initial problems, but they may mostly been worked out by Toronto and were fairly good, fairly reliable. And the problems were on the same arm piercing 250 pounds, same arm piercing bombs. They did, weren't all going off as they were supposed to. If they had done, there would have been a lot more damage done by the bombers. Uh, in car, did the Italians correctly surmise the direction where the Italians just had launched their, uh, from and evacuated these? No. They didn't. They didn't launch any strikes on her very much. They barely knew where she was. Dev Squad, would the submarines be more useful in trying to sink a logistics train going from Italy to North Africa? I think that's where they were. They were also doing some various interesting SBS operations and other things going on. The submarines were doing a lot of intelligence as well, gathering ops. Ian Speller, one of the hits on Turbis was by a bomb that had virtually no explosive in it. Quality control problems weren't all on one side. Nope. Uh, the duplex system has a contact, has a magnetic detonator which will go off if they pass underneath a ship, but has a contact detonator which goes off if they hit the ship. So, you know, if they run shallow, they hit the ship, they go off, bang. If they run, and the reason they set them at 33 foot was they were supposed to pass underneath them. And this is actually what I think saves the Vettoria Veneto, because I don't think the magnetic detonators work that well on the harbour. But you also have to remember the British have an advantage when it comes to magnetic detonators in that they're able to study the magnetic field worldwide. They have bases all over the world. They have ships going all over the world. They have lots of things going. So they are far more able to work out what they have a far better basis of knowledge of the differences in the Earth's magnetic field when they are setting up their magnetic detonators. Ian Carr, where were the surviving Italian fleet sent to the following raid? Naples. So...
just getting you all a nice picture for you. Settings, change, now the Italian fleet moves from Taranto to Naples, which is a very big move if you think about it, because it basically has changed not only the side of Italy that the fleet is on, but it's moved them from being a problem for the Eastern, uh, for the Mediterranean fleet to a problem for Force H. But it's also taken them a long way away from the critical point. Because if you are trying to pass a convoy to Malta, yes, they are still a threat to any convoy coming from the Western Mediterranean. But to any convoy coming from the Eastern Mediterranean, they now have to sail a very long way to get there. They have to sail all the way down and out. So it, make, it provides you with a lot of protection for your operations if you've managed to force the fleet back. And interesting enough, this is the thing that you uh, go. If you have had a little bit more logistics, a little bit more support, and a little bit more freedom, if the interesting thing would have been if Ark Royal had been able to launch a strike on the 12th, when the Italian fleet arrives at Naples, or on the 13th, the Italian fleet in Naples, if Ark Royal had been able to launch a strike then, that would have been quite a major thing, because then the Italian fleet would have gone, we're all here, we're safe, bang, oh, frick! Wouldn't have matter if there was any, really any damage. The, the Italian fleet would have started to feel it was really hounded, and probably would have drawn their fleet, possibly to Venice, even. Ning Waters, that chap's fury at all his hits being duds. Does that mean this was the first time you had problems with those bombs? Yes. In car, Wiki says that no torpedo was discovered when, ra when raising the Tory on the ship. Yes. One, bo one torpedo went off, didn't go off. Um, but again, out of 12, if one doesn't go off, that's not exactly a problem. It managed to bury itself in that. In that. And um, they didn't really find out much from that torpedo. Brent Palace. Uh, hello, Brent. Uh, was well, scientific research common on warships crews in the 20th century? The Royal Navy were doing a lot of it. That's why the Royal Navy had all the oceanographic units and several of the sloops were oceanographic vessels and survey vessels. Martina Henry. Hen uh, another well spent evening. Many thanks. Thank you. Near Quarters, at least one was under Nizer now and in dry dock when it was drained. <sighs> I 
Hmm, only 16 and 40. Hmm, US Naval War College seems to be having its graduation now and broadcasting virtually. That's nice. That's what I think. Nick Waters, I think it was a thousand pound bomb that was found underneath Nisenau. That would make more sense. Not a torpedo. Ian Carr, dangerous to get to Naples, surrounded by Italy, Sicily, and Sardinia. That's the whole point. <laughs> that is the thing. It's dangerous to get to Naples. As I said, if Ark Royal had been able to launch it, that's great. But that it would be going straight into the teeth of enemy air attacks. Not probably not, but you see the thing is, if I'd been the again, if if we are going to get into a what if scenario of whether it could be done, you would probably have to come up between uh, Sicily and Sardinia. Um... It would be a f you would have to have the distractions going on, but also please do remember that at the same time as they'd been launching the strikes out on Taranto the day before, HMS Ark Royal had struck Genoa. So that's a fairly high risk operation for the Royal Navy to do for a distraction. It works as a distraction. But I think if the Royal Navy could have been able to mount a sufficient distraction, they think it would have gone. If they could have done another attack on Genoa or something else as another attack, they would have done it as a distraction. So basically, if they'd been going for Naples, they'd have probably, yes, had to come through between Sardinia and Sicily. But you would have probably got maybe Illustrious launching an attack on Cantania or Syracuse. You know, uh, they'd have had a strike going in somewhere else to cover it. Nick Waters, looking at the geography of Italy, do they have Taranto and then a West Coast base? I'm guessing more small ones on the bus. Pretty much. West Coast base is Naples, mainly. And Genoa is also quite a big base. And they also use... Um, I think it's... Uh, Rimini is used quite a bit. And, of course, Venice. Because you can... Park quite a lot in a lagoon. Mm. But it it's an interesting idea. As I said, it's an option which they would have liked to do if they could. But, you know. Mm. Trentanenko, uh, Duck Luck, had FAA aircraft transitioned to VHF radios at the time of the, the Toronto strike? Some had, some didn't. And not all of them had. Uh, they don't seem to use them much in this operation. But there again, there is the Royal Navy is very, very, um, how do I put this? They prefer to not make radio transmissions unless they really, really have to. So I have a feeling any aircraft doing any radio um, operations would have only done radio actions if they had felt they couldn't find the carrier and they were completely lost. I don't think any of them used air uh, radio at all. And they certainly didn't use radio to communicate with the other aircraft. Because you don't want to tell the enemy you're coming, and they keep it very, very tight. Hmm. 
Hmm. In car, Operation Tungsten. Furious Victorious is some escort carriers. Strike aircraft of Barracudas, Corsairs, Hellcat, and Wildcats. Other main Italian place was La Spezia, uh, Spezia Northern Italy. Yeah. La Spezia. Nick Waters. Cold War. That straight facing Albania will have been tense. Yeah, there were several incidents. It's another thing to say. There's whole sorts of incidents between the British and the Albanians at the beginning of the Cold War in the Mediterranean. And the British deal with them without recourse to the Americans or anyone else. And it's, it's one of the interesting things you start to realize is that the traditional idea that Britain post Second World War is a nation which maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Um no longer the first power, one of the first ranked powers in the world, definitely doesn't realize it is. It doesn't think it is. Mentally, it isn't. It's an interesting scenario. Anyway, it's nearly 10 o'clock, and I have, well, I have a commitment every night at 10 o'clock. I go and um, brush the fluffy research assistant and make sure he's all nice and neat and tidy and comfy before bed. So I'm going to say thank you to everyone for being here. Thank you to everyone who has done a super chat. It's very nice to have the contributions to the Iron Brew Fund. Thank you very much. And the book fund. And thank you very much to, for people who have liked. Thank you to everyone who has subscribed. Thank you to everyone who's pressed the little bell down there. Thank you to everyone who's on Discord. Thank you to everyone who's a patron. It's all very nice of you. And thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed tonight. And I hope you enjoyed the videos which will be coming out from Build Trumps. And the video, the um, later on tomorrow morning, the Bilge Pumps regular goes live. With this week, it's the podcast is with Simon Elliott on the Roman Navy, and it's absolutely amazing. It is really, really amazing. In car, Iron Destroyer sunk post World War Two in Core Food Count Channel. Yes, uh, it damaged by mines. Manly 1640, who is, isn't a first ranked power, and what do they think? Uh, that's the trouble. The, and the Americans, that, uh, no one's quite sure who is a first, first ranked power, because whilst the Russians technically could claim to it, the Royal Navy and the fact that Britain's global empire after the World War II means that strategically they still are a first ranked power because they're everywhere. Um, and it's only after sort of uh, the changing the transition from empire to commonwealth and all sorts of things that they really sort of start to go down in terms of their strategic global reach. But they still do maintain global reach. So it's one of those issues. Anyway, that's for a whole nother discussion. Thank you to Melanie 1640 for being here. Thank you to Nick Waters, Ian Carr, Earthborn Gnome. Thank you for joining us. Stephen Melanie, thank you. Tons of great. I'm glad. And I'm glad Earthborn Gnome you enjoyed it. Cadron, night. John Shea, night. Thank you for being here. Albert Sasky, thank you. Blue Shirt Buddha, thank you. Dirt Squad, thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Dunrick Ana, thank you. In Car, thank you. DGV40, thank you. Nick Waters, thank you very much. And thank you to everyone who's been commenting and chatting away. It's always nice to have all these people. Ian Sadler, Ian. Eddie Goetz, who was the naval question I set up for Mastermind, was in the Corfu incident. Uh, incident. Mine's in the Corfu channel. Ooh. Mine's are never good. Take care, Ian Sadler. Calvin Gaswood, night, night. Thank you. Chris Southgate, thank you. All right. Um, Aviator and Prize, thank you. Take care. Martin Hen Martini Henry, uh, thank you. Uh, Brent Palace, thank you. Trent McCartney, thank you. Greg Sadowski, thank you. Uh, let's go on a higher. Anyone else? Uh, Nova Cass. No, uh, Nova Chrysalis, thank you. Juno101, thank you. Osprey28, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Yogi Khan, thank you. And hello, Lucas Strauss, thank you. And thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Tarantalenko, thank you. All right, then let's do that.